serious question. Why do we believe in gods at all? Like, what is the science behind that? Don't any of you have the guts to play for blood? I'm your huckleberry. That's just my game. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Derek Lambert. If you're new to the channel, I'm introducing myself. I am very thankful that I live in a secular society where I have the opportunity to explore topics like why do we believe in God at all to begin with? And I think it's important the more we study and learn ourselves, history, the scientific approach, we learn about things that were taboo or even discredit ideas that may not be helpful, that might actually prevent us from progressing as a human race. Yes, I once denied evolution. I believed in young earth creationism. And I was really anti-science. I was more a biblicist. And I came across like debates with William Lane Craig and other apologists back in the day with Christopher Hitchens. And Hitchens used to say things like, why is it that this God with his amazing accent, and I didn't like him at the time, but why is it that this God decides to show up at like just recent history? Man has like not had this figured out until recently, the revelation of the truth about what God is. Is it one God, many gods? Like they can't even figure this out today. But the truth about God doesn't come till just in recent history and for hundreds of thousands of years. Suffering and death and disease and famine and people dying at birth, not even being able to make it, let alone not even getting into the topic of abortions. Like you couldn't survive. It was just not a world with antibiotics, all sorts of problems. And I used to think, I don't like that idea. And I'd push it into the back of my mind. Like, how come it took so long? And God sat back and watched the human race just suffer through ice age and death and turmoil and tribe against tribe and starvation and other predators and diseases. And like, this is a really good question, but I just didn't like Hitchens tone. I couldn't handle what he said and cognitive dissonance had me by the balls. It really did. I wasn't ready to accept what he had to say. So time and other arguments somehow seep in and it softens my cognitive dissonance, allowing me to consider things I wasn't willing to do, plus the fact that I suffered with drug addiction for so many years. I think when you're beat up and you're finally willing to say, you know what, this isn't working, I'm going to die, something has to change, and then you're willing to consider new ideas. That is when I actually deconverted. Most people become religious in the process of getting off of drugs. And I had the reverse effect. What helped free me, and I've never thought about actually going back, was this religious idea that I was trapped in. I feel freedom like a, you'd say I'm born again. Like I legit feel freedom. I don't condemn myself. I don't feel guilt and shame about a God that isn't there, that I believed was there. But that isn't there. But Derek, you don't know that it isn't there. And this is why I take the scientific approach. This is why science, I think, will help us understand. You know, long ago, volcanoes erupted because of the gods. The gods were either in them or on top of them or behind the cloud. They were pissed off at mankind. And so what did they do? They sent the floods and destroyed Atlantis, right? The mythological story of Atlantis. They sent the volcano to destroy this place or that place. And now we know like, oh, there's this thing called tectonic plates that cause, you know, the shift in the crust and causes pressure to rise. In fact, mountains are actually due to that. And we find seashells and stuff on the tops of mountains that they shouldn't be there because they're way above sea level. Why? Because the flood, the universal flood, I once believed, but now we know that 
mountains arise, tectonic plates break apart and cause the shift in the crust. And then boom, we have a natural explanation. But the God idea still remains. So now we have to pump the God idea further away from, well, he's not behind the cloud because why? We've been behind the cloud. He's not like in the volcano. We, you know, we kind of looked into these volcanoes. Examples, I'm making the point. Like God keeps getting pushed back. And then we have these philosophical ideas where we throw around like, why is God not, like, why is he hidden? The divine hiddenness. Why, why is God hiding? In all of these mythological tales and stories of ancient people that talk about their gods, their gods are present. Their gods are involved. The stories have their gods appear in the Bible for sure. Like God actually shows up at times. Now, one might say that this is just, um, what is it, a theophany or that God's angel or presence is appearing or whatever the theological explanation later is. Other academics that are trying to point out what the ancient Near Eastern text is saying is just like the other ancient Near Eastern text. If it walks like a duck, it talks like a duck. Holy crap, it's a duck. Like that's the most plausible Occam's razor, less ad hoc explanation for why the text looks and appears like the other ancient Near Eastern text. This God had a body. This God was really looks like a human. But, but don't worry, we were made in his image. We didn't make God in ours. So there's like this conception, right? Trying to explain where we come from. Why do we die? We have the myth of Genesis, all of these things. And today I wanted to actually play, I think, a very underappreciated presentation that I've interviewed before on my channel with Dr. Andy Thompson. And he's a psychologist who wrote a book called Why We Believe in Gods. And we're going to go into the science behind it. You know, we now know the science of volcanoes. Do we think the gods do it? Well, in the metaphysical realm, in the invisible realm where we humans have no way of testing and verifying or anything like that, that's where God resides. That's where God con constantly does these things. But in the ancient text, that's not the way things played out. That's not how things were described. The angel of death brought the plague. Is COVID-19 due to the angel of death? I guarantee you there are, you know, superstitious people like I once was. So I'm picking on myself, my past self, who still think that the famines and diseases and whatnot are due to sin or evil. I remember when uh, the floods came in New, or New Orleans. And it was because of the homosexuality in America. And that godforsaken land, California, is going to fall off the edge of the United States. It's going to sink into the ocean because of God's sin. And really, in reality, there, there is the possibility that the West Coast, you know, a large chunk could break off and end up in the sea. But that's because we now know where one of the plates are and that there's landmass that shifts. Do we need to place that on evil activities? Uh, this is the thing I think uh, a lot of people believe, like I did, and I'm trying to show these are man-made perceptions, concepts, and we've evolved to come to these conclusions. I think evolution plays a big, big role. Now, no matter what's said today, no matter what I can show you the mechanics, let's say, we can explain the why or the how, behind that, no matter what, God continues to shift because you're not going to remove God from a theist who's devoted, who's not actually needing the evidence. They just, they, they have that kind of philosophical, why does anything exist? And I'll start there. So if anything at all can be explained away scientifically, well, in that divine hiddenness realm where God resides, where God's not seen, that's where all this stuff takes place. That's how all of this stuff still happens. So you can explain the mechanisms, the biology, you can go through all of that. It doesn't matter. You don't debunk my God. My God still exists in those realms. And I think after a while, when we're honest with ourselves, starting with the doubting position of saying, why do I think there's a God there to begin with? Why do I posit the God of the gapped hypothesis just so that I have an explanation for something we don't understand yet, therefore God? Anyway, welcome to the chat, everybody. I really appreciate everybody tuning in. Travis, what's up? 
Number one here, 50,000 myth money in your pocket right now, brother. You're going to heaven. Sassy Raven, looking forward to this. And then Shy, what is up? Everybody in the chat, Logan, James, Exa Music, everybody who's showing up here. Ricky Johnson, thanks for being members, everybody. I really appreciate you joining True Salvation because you know this is where it's at. I mean, this is the true. Our ontology is correct. We have the correct heaven. All of those phony other you know, created religions. Well, that was just Satan making it look like myth vision, but we're here now. We have the real salvation here now. Martin, thank you so much for that. Uh, we are myth vision. Batman watches over. I'm just showing love to everybody in the chat before we get started here. The, the ghost of myth vision. Welcome, welcome. Melody Joy, welcome. Guitar Dog, what is up, everybody? I hope you're ready to learn a little something, something if you haven't already watched this. Yes, Jezza. I'm actually the bringer of salvation. I thought I was saved, right? Like, you know how Jesus got baptized for the remission of sins in Mark? Yeah, for the remission of sins. Did Jesus sin? Well, yes, because I was a sinner too, you know? But then when I got baptized, I realized who I really was. You know, and then it was like, duh, I should start a cult. Here I am today, right? We got a cult. And um, yeah, that's all. You know, it's just a cult. Harmless. You know, I don't have a, look, I got to give myself some credit. Like I don't have a groupie of girls, you know, like typical cult leaders do that are just, I'm missing out on some things, you know, as a cult leader, but we're getting there. We're getting there. Seriously, we are going to get there. So all right, let me share a few things. Let's show you why uh, we believe in gods. This is the book, Why We Believe in Gods, a concise guide to the science of faith. Andy Thompson, and he's busy. I would have him on the show, but also I am done with the house. We're trying to sell it right now. We listed the house here in North Carolina, and I had a little time here to just pop on here and do a lot with you guys. Um, I also dropped this on the Patreon. I got to refresh this. Because I just let everyone who follows the Patreon, who joins the Patreon, know that they're saved, number one. You are covered by the blood of myth vision. And uh, you don't have to worry about uh, any post-mortem death, fire, Hades, any of that kind of stuff. I kick their ass. Don't worry. They don't want none of this. Um, and, you know, none of the gods can, can touch me on that either. So I just shared that. I also did a release here on 153 fish thing. And there's so many wild rabbit holes on numbers in the Bible Dr. Jeffrey Tripp, of course, I released some of my other stuff. And some of this stuff is early access that, you know, you have to join the Patreon to find. I've got hundreds of videos like that. Help us out. Join. Join True Salvation. You know, you'll feel a burden lifted. My yoke is easy, just so you know. Please check me out. And Andy Thompson, it is jandersonthompson.com. I'll put that in the chat. I forgot to add that in the description. Because this is the gentleman or the scholar, if you will, the doctor, the psychiatrist, who actually is going to give the presentation that he's done on my channel before. Any super chats that I get during this live stream, I will pause, I will answer, I will respond. I do appreciate the support, keeping the lights on here in Myth Vision Heaven. Jay Anderson Thompson is an MD. He is a psychiatrist in private practice in Charles Charlottesville, Charlottesville, Virginia, Charlottesville. Virginia, however you want to pronounce it. He is also a staff psychiatrist at Counseling and Psychological Services at the University of Virginia, Student Health Services and Institute of Law, Psychiatry and Public Policy at the University of Virginia. Dr. Thompson's current research interest is in the area of evolutionary psychology and using its principles to understand depression, suicide, terrorism, and religious belief. And then I, I thought this was worth looking at his curriculum. Why We Believe in Gods. Uh, Facing Bipolar, The Young Adult's Guide to Dealing with Bipolar Disorder, We Few, We Happy Few, We Band of Brothers, The Dynamics of Suicide Terrorism, New York Times article, Depression Upside, A New Look at Depression, Evolution in the Brain, um, Who Are We? Let's Go There, Where Did We Come From, How Religious Identity, Identity Divides and Damns Us All. So there's a lot of interesting things in evolutionary analysis of whether antidepressants do more harm than good, all sorts of fun stuff. Check him out. He also has that book, like I said. This is the presentation that we're going to play, and look at my crazy hair. That was before I started combing it back. 
Uh, yeah. So we're going to play that in just a second. Let me grab your super chats here. Ghost of Mythfish says, Alpha Mel is hardwired in us, so we look for God. I don't, I don't know if it has anything to do with uh, Alpha Mel or not, because there were goddesses in the ancient world and feminine, divine, and male. But I bet patriarchal societies definitely would portray their God as divine. In fact, I think that's why Yahwism ruled the day and Asherah gets divorced in a patriarchal monotheistic culture, like what the Jews had, you know, it's purely male. God is a male. Boom. Uh, it is what it is, but I think it's more just a human thing, regardless of, of what gender someone is. Uh, I think that the representation of that God being male might tell us something though. Constellation Pegasus, I got that book. Now, where is it? Time to organize my new library. Thank you, Constellation, for that super chat. Appreciate that, man. All right, we're going to go ahead and we're going to dive in. This is going to be, I hope, eye-opening for many. This was eye-opening for me when I first heard his presentation. He did um, at some atheist type of evolutionary scientific conference back in the day with Richard Dawkins and such. And uh, it really blew my mind. I was like, holy smokes. So Andy Thompson for you, everybody. If you have any super chats, I will pause and I will definitely grab it. I seriously appreciate the support because heaven needs money. You know, uh, <laughs> myth vision needs money. It's bottom line. I mean, Yahweh needs money, so I'm no different, right? <laughs> the gods need money. The churches need money. Why wouldn't I? Uh, same thing. Anyway, here we go. I'm just starting it out. Psychiatry and public policy at the University of Virginia. Dr. Thompson's current research interest is in the area of evolutionary psychology and using its principles to understand depression, suicide, terrorism, and religious belief. And I think you got suicide terrorism. So I think that kind of goes into the same thing. Uh, why, why are fanatics fanatics? He also wrote a book, Everyone needs to get their hands on why we believe in gods, right? So I saw a presentation on YouTube a while back with him and Richard Dawkins, Dr. Dawkins, why we believe in gods, a concise guide to the science of faith. Um, really, really interesting book. The forward is done by Richard Dawkins. It's a really, really well-written book and it goes deep. You're going to get a glimpse into this book today in a presentation that he's going to elaborate and take you through the reasons why we believe in gods at all. You know, what is the point? And uh, I'm, I'm going to have a little Q&A after this, but he's going to give a visual presentation. I hope you guys like this video. Make sure you guys become a patron. You guys go down in the description to help get the book from uh, Dr. Tom. Just so you know, you know how Christians will tell you like, and I get it. They're just trying to save you. They care. You know, they're just trying to help you. That's why they're trying to give you the gospel and tell you about this warning of this place called hell. This is why I tell everybody to join my Patreon. I, I'm coming from a good place. I'm trying to save everybody. Um, you know, do you really want to risk it and end up going to a place of eternal consciousness? Don't, don't risk it. Come on, join the club. We've got everything for you. You're good. And any other of the links that he has down in the description, I ask you guys to go support what he does. So with that being said, welcome to the show. Thank you. On the dogmas of religion as distinguished from moral principle, all mankind from the beginning of the world to the present have been fighting, quarreling, burning, and torturing one another over abstractions unintelligible to themselves and to all others and absolutely beyond the comprehension of the human mind. Absolutely beyond the comprehension of the human mind. Thomas Jefferson said those words in 1816. And the essence of my talk today is that should you run into Mr. Jefferson next week, you could say to him, no, Mr. President, Religion is no longer beyond the comprehension of the human mind. In fact, we are tantalizingly close to a cognitive neuroscience of religious belief. We now know why human minds generate religious beliefs, why they are so powerful, why we are all vulnerable to subscribe to them and to spread them. That knowledge is before us. We're the first generation in the history of the world that is starting to understand and have a comprehensive understanding of why human minds are vulnerable to generate and to accept religious beliefs. And what you can also say to Mr. Jefferson is that we're in that position because when he made those comments in 1816, there was a seven-year-old boy in England, Charles Darwin, 
who would grow up to give us one of the most important, if not the most important idea that ever occurred to human mind, evolution by natural selection. The only workable explanation we have for the design and variety of all life on Earth, and also the only workable explanation we have for the architecture of the human mind, and part of that architecture, the pieces that lead to religious belief. And Darwin himself, when he wrote Origin of the Species in 1859, he knew the implication of his discovery because in the next to the last paragraph, he said psychology will be based on a new foundation. And it took about 150 years for the, the principles of evolutionary biology to be applied to the human mind. And one of the findings that came out of evolutionary psychology, evolutionary anthropology, is the understanding of why human minds generate religious beliefs. And let me give you a little map of what we're going to be doing this morning. And the other interesting thing is that uh, today is actually Darwin's birthday, February 12th. <laughs> he would have been 211 years old today. So happy birthday, Mr. Darwin. Let me give you a map. We're going to do the, basic, the basics of the modern Darwinian synthesis, evolution by natural selection. Then we're going to do a little bit about human evolution, because that's important. And then we will go into just some of the cognitive neuroscience of religious belief. What I hope to show you is that religious belief arises from mechanisms that we use in everyday life. Even though religious ideas may seem extreme, they are really just one step away from ideas that we use every day, that you're using. This is what we're going to come back to this in just a second. I, I just want to pop up here for a second to say, this is what really did it for me. Like when, what he just said, there's really profound. Everything we do naturally, like on an everyday day basis, the way we are about natural things, religion and the way it hijacks the mind and does what it does is literally right there in the same natural, normal, everyday things we do. And he's going to break this down and show you naturally, like I said at the opening of this video. Well, we thought gods controlled the volcanoes and they were mad at mankind. That's why they burned up the cities and whatnot. The gods were anger of their sin or whatever. Little Timmy couldn't keep his hand on off of his junk. So he kept jerking and God got mad. And, you know, why did you do that, little Timmy? Um, we now know that the volcanoes aren't, you know, controlled by these gods doing these things. We have good reason to know the natural phenomena of why and how. Uh, sure, you could keep going back and then fall into that trap again, like, why is there anything rather than nothing? But then the God of the gaps argument comes in. And so just paying attention to why we believe using natural things, like talk to a Christian and, you know, they will probably, in the West at least, from what I can tell, will try to follow along and track what you're trying to say. But this, when you really start to grasp the natural mechanism of why and how we come to believe in gods and why do we do it to begin with, it really is an eye-opener. So let's pay attention, see what happens. See what happens. Right now. And then we'll talk about religious ritual. Religion comes from the word religere, which means to bind. And I'll show you why religion empowers itself by harnessing certain neurotransmitters in religious ritual, one of the other things that makes it so powerful. Before I jump into the talk, I want to thank a number of people. First and foremost, Mr. Lambert for contacting me and asking me to give you this presentation today. Also, my co-author on the book, Claire Alcifer, and my publisher, Kurt Bolton, but particularly uh, Richard Dawkins. Uh, I've had the opportunity to work with his foundation, now part of CFI, to learn from him. Also, the others at the forefront of the secular movement, the late Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Ion Hercioli, all of those people. And the really unsung heroes of this presentation, all the anthropologists, the psychologists, whose research is giving us that comprehensive understanding of religious belief. All right. This is the typical understanding of evolution by natural selection. Certain traits enhance survival. If that's what you think, I want to shift your understanding just a little bit, because it's not survival. It's only survival for reproductive success and the reproductive success of genes, right? 
the modern Darwinian synthesis shows us that evolution doesn't act at the level of the individual, me. Evolution acts at the level of the gene, the double helix. And if you step back from it for a moment, um, that makes sense, because what's the fundamental unit of life? It's the genes. We're right now in the midst of a coronavirus epidemic, and genes that build viruses that can easily spread into hosts, those are the genes that proliferate. We're now hearing about these mutants, these variants. When you hear that, that's a genetic, that's a genetic shift that makes that virus more able to reproduce the genes that built that virus. That's the modern Darwinian synthesis. This is a nice statement of it. I'm gonna give you a moment here, let you read it, and then I'll explain more. An organism is an integrated collection of problem-solving devices, adaptations that were shaped by natural selection over evolutionary time to promote, in some specific way, the survival of the genes that directed their construction. Simmons, 2005. So, if you think about it, every organism, you, me, bacteria, plants, is this integrated collection of problem-solving devices that are solving a constant stream of problems. My heart solved the problem of pumping blood. My lung solved the problem of extracting oxygen from the air. Hemoglobin in our blood solves the problem of transporting that oxygen all over the body. So at every level of biological inquiry, from cells to brains to people, integrated collection of problem-solving devices. Now, the other reason this statement is important is because this is also a description of the human mind. The mind is what the brain does. And the brain is this integrated collection of problem-solving devices shaped by natural selection over evolutionary time to promote, in some way, the survival of the genes that built those problem-solving devices, those adaptations. So you're looking at this screen right now. This screen is an upside-down two-dimensional image on your retina, and your brain has myriad adaptations which are turning it into the three-dimensional view that you have. And I like Steve Pinker's analogy. The, the mind is like the Apollo spacecraft. What's the Apollo spacecraft? It's this compact array of engineering devices that are solving a constant stream of problems, only some of which are made conscious to the astronauts. Your, your mind brain is the same thing. It is solving a constant stream of problems, some of which become conscious to you. And we're gonna be particularly focused on what are called social adaptations. The adaptations in our mind that are used to negotiate the complexities of social life. I must say, uh, Dr. Thompson, that's what interested me. And, and there's so many things that are so clever in your presentation that, and in your book, of course, which is seriously, go get the book, guys. I mean, I cannot recommend that enough because you're going to see your everyday life, common things that you just never thought. For example, um, it, when you're going to sleep and you feel like you're falling off the edge of a cliff. Well, you know, I always do that. And I catch my breath like, oh man, go to sleep. Why did I feel like I was falling? Well, a lot of people say, uh, you know, uh, well, you, you just stopped breathing or this and this and that. Come to find out, we once lived in trees, and this might ah. be an evolutionary mechanism preventing us from. So I'm just giving it like a just a little tease. You're right. going to see very, things. Thank you. No, that's a that's a nice example. We are very sensitive to falling, and and to falling off of edges, and so we wake up very easily. And that may be a legacy of our time as Lucy, when we were still living in trees, and we had to be you know sensitive about falling out of a tree because we can get killed or eaten. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Lucy, let's now shift. Uh, and and please, uh, Mr. Lambert. Just what you just did. If you see something that's interesting you want to highlight, absolutely jump in. Please. I just thought what you said was fascinating because we're going to well, see things we can't usually see. You're going to break down. You're going to interpret things for us in a way that we would not know to interpret them. And that's why I'm thankful for what you do. Well, no, and I'm, uh, you're going to jump in, I think, probably at places where people uh, who are you know part of your uh, broadcast would also be interested. So absolutely. It's a way of getting an indirect audience here. Yes, sir. All right. Now we're going to switch to human evolution. And this is a painting on a, a cave, obviously. And I picked it deliberately, notice the bow. All right. The fundamental here is that we are not fallen angels. We are risen apes. We are actually an African ape. And in that development, in that development of mammals and primates and African apes are the mechanisms, the everyday mechanisms that go to, to building religious belief. And Darwin knew this. And, and even though the origin of species and natural selection is clearly also relates to humans. Uh, he, he never mentioned humans. They were the, the, the sort of great unacknowledged presence in that book. Uh, and this is the one place that he uh, mentioned it. He knew we were probably descendants of apes in Africa. He knew it at the time that he wrote The Origin. 
and uh, he then uh, published it in, in 1870. Right. Um, I want you to... Uh... Okay. Um, the ad uh, is trying change. to kick in. So everybody knows I am playing a clip I did earlier, a couple years back, year and a half back, on why we believe in God's welcome to the chat. Hit the like button. Show us some love. Um, if it's going too fast, I can just play it at normal speed. I just sped it up by 0.25. Let's try it at normal. Let's see how this thing works. Your mind about Africa. Um, if somebody asks you where you're from, uh, uh, you say Africa. And uh, you would say, wait, I thought you were from Texas. <laughs> well, you know, most recently. But actually, uh, I'm originally from Africa. Um, Africa has our bones. Africa is where we uh, arose. Uh, we are all Africans. Um, there are seven plus billion people on the earth today. All seven billion of us are descendants of a small group of hunter-gatherers that arose in Africa two to 300,000 years ago and conquered the world. So put aside your religious, racial, ethnic, political differences. Underneath our skins, we are all Africans. And if you look uh, to your right, you'll see what is called the Great Rift Valley, which runs from Somalia down the east coast of Africa all the way to South Africa. And you want to think of that as the probable birth canal of the human species. Um, it's called the East Side Story. That's probably where we arose. And one of the crucial things was the switch uh, to becoming primates. Primates have eyes uh, in the front of their head. Um, think of a squirrel um, with the eyes on the side of the head. You can see that most of it is just one eye, monocular vision. And the areas of binocular vision, two eyes, is very small. Right? And binocular vision is much, much better. And we evolve binocular vision. Primates, monkeys, apes, and you can see that it's a much, much greater field. But you can't see your back, so you need somebody to have your back. You are a social species. We have each other's back. We are all our brothers and sisters keepers. Think of lemurs. Think of uh, lemurs as your earliest primate ancestor. The, the early primates were like modern-day lemurs. Now, next time you go to your uh, family physician, and they ask for your family history, give them this. Right? This is your history as a primate, uh, and it goes from the primates on your left of 65 million years ago, primates, then monkeys, and then the evolution of apes. You see in the middle, the last common ancestor between uh, monkeys and apes, probably 25 million years ago. Now, you can say, well, Andy, why are you going over this? Okay, because many of the mechanisms you have are, are, are ancient far more uh, ancient than us. As we'll talk about, one of the crucial things in religion is the attachment system. And the attachment system is a basic mammalian system. Right? Also, like whales have attachments, okay? But it's crucial to primates, it's crucial to uh, monkeys, to apes, and to us, the attachment system. So many of the systems I'm gonna be talking about go back even well, be, you know, well, well before us. Um, so this is your, 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 your primate where we shifted from basic mammals to primates. Now, I want you to look over on the right, the other uh, black silhouette. That's the common ancestor, the last common ancestor um, between chimps and bonobos and us. We share about 99% of our uh, genes with chimps and bonobos. And so about 5 million years ago, it's a common ancestor, and one line became chimps and bonobos, and the other line um, became the hominids. And you see that little squiggle just to your right that goes from the uh, the black silhouette of two humans. That that tiny little line um, is this. Okay? This is your hominid family history. So if your physician says, uh, no, 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 I want your immediate family history, this is what you give. This is your, this is the hominid line, five million years of evolution of hominids, right? Artipithecus, Australopithecines. Um, and if your physician says, no, 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 I want your immediate family history, right? Okay, you give them this, right? This is our genus Homo, Homo erectus, uh, Homo habilis. And our genus is 2.4 million years old. 
And it is very hard for us to get our minds around the time sequences involved here. They're obviously massive. But if you just take our genus Homo, right, 2.4 million years, here's a little exercise you can do. Think of today, February 12th, the whole day, 24 hours, okay? We're going to take every hour and make it 100,000 years. So today, 24 hours is 2.4 million years ago. So midnight uh, last night, our genus Homo shows up. Sometime this morning around 6 o'clock, some of them start to leave Africa. Right? About noon today, um, some will make, make it to what is modern-day Europe. Um, at 6 o'clock tonight, our immediate ancestor, Homo heidelbergensis, shows up in Africa. Some of the Homo heidelbergensis goes to what is now Europe and become Neanderthals about 9 o'clock tonight. In Africa, about 10 o'clock tonight, we show up, Homo sapiens. And it is probably about 11.20 tonight that fully formed modern, you and me, anatomically, behaviorally modern human beings show up at 11.20 tonight. Right? It is not until, it is not until six minutes before midnight, right, about 10,000 years ago, that we settled down into agricultural communities in the Near East. Uh, and in some sense, modern life begins. We settle down in agricultural communities. And we may actually have settled down into those agricultural communities to brew a better beer. We may owe civilization to beer, but that's another story. But the modern, you know, what we think of as, as modern uh, times, even the most, you know, the, the most basic agricultural hunter-gatherer life, um, it, a settled life in, in pre-agricultural agricultural communities is six minutes before midnight, right? And that's just our genus Homo, 2.4 million years. Why am I going through this? Because all of the social mechanisms that I'm talking about that went into religion, that go into religion, again, many of them come out of that period of time. Mm. And uh, this just shows, uh, you know, our genus leaving Africa, uh, the, the numbers are in millions of years. So, you know, and these are some of the, the archaeologic sites. But we, we, we come out of Africa starting almost, you know, two million years ago. Um, then our species, again, shows up in Africa. Uh, we're somewhere between 200, 300,000 years old. And then we leave Africa and we conquer the world. And we are the last surviving hominid. Neanderthals lasted to. A special shout out, Spike is Spike is. Hope I'm saying it right. Thanks for that super chat, man. Really appreciate it. Really, really do. Um, you're going to have wings in heaven. Let's continue. So, you know, maybe 25,000 years ago, a Homo florensis on the little island off of Indonesia. I think that's like 20,000 years ago. But we're now the last surviving hominid, right? Why? That's one of the great questions. And one of the answers may be because we develop mechanisms of what's called ultra-sociality. We're intensely cooperative social species. That may be part of the reasons. And it's those social mechanisms that go into religion. Um, and we migrated all around the world. Notice uh, the, uh, the man in the middle and the one in the back, and also actually the man in the front. Notice what they're car carrying. And uh, one of the reasons we may have conquered the world is that somewhere around 70,000 years ago, we developed bow and arrow technology, right? uh, a kind of paleolithic nuclear weapon. Mm. And we know Neanderthals had spears. We know Homo, Homo heidelbergensis had spears. But what we know is that they didn't throw them, that it was all up close. And so 70,000 years ago, we uh, developed the deadly bow and arrow technology. And one of the reasons we may be the last surviving hominid is we wiped out all the others. What's some of the evidence for that? Uh, this is one of the earliest uh, grave sites of our species. These are Homo sapiens in Egypt. And all the pencils point to, these are two males, and all the pencils point to arrowheads that are embedded in their bodies. Hmm. What is one of the uses of religion? It is to bind groups together and to prepare them and to encourage them for war. And you can see the caption, if you believe in me, divide into sex, kill and hurt as many from the other sex as you possibly can. <laughs> and as we will talk about, one of the uses of religion is to bond men together for the purposes of violence and war, intergroup aggression. And we'll also see that that's one of the uh, purposes of religious rituals. So... Again, I can't stress enough that um, whenever you think of the origins of humans and our psychology, um, our psychology did not arise in 19th century Europe. Our psychology is a hunter-gatherer psychology 
from the savannas of Africa that evolved over millions of years. Right? Always keep in mind that the evolutionary past is what frames your experiences of the present. Our modern skulls contain a hunter-gatherer brain. I need to, I need to give a special shout out Nidimus. You really wanted to be saved. You came down to the altar today. Hallelujah. This monkey has successfully mashed keys and given myth bucks. Thank you, my friend. I really appreciate the super chat. It means a lot. It does. Thank you, Nidimus. Back to the presentation. Now we're still sadly very, very tribal. Um, another way to think about this is that, um, Life for most of our evolutionary history was an endless camping trip with close relatives. I don't know how fun that would be. Um, <laughs> I yeah, guess you get used to being a social creature. I'm just being. Okay. Okay. Let me take a moment here. Give a shout out to a few people. Derek Cruz. Great show today, Derek. Thank you so much, Derek. I really appreciate it. Appreciate the support. And Spike is, says this monkey has not, or has he? Thank you. I appreciate the support. All right. This is going to get juicy. Pay attention to the details because this presentation really was an eye opener. Thank you for that super chat. Funny, of course, yeah. but you probably enjoy it in those days. That was kind of part of life. Being... Well, yes and no. I think there were advantages, clearly. I mean, I think people were closer and more mutually interdependent than maybe today. But uh, I'm quite grateful for antibiotics and electricity and hot showers. Uh, but my psychology, just like all of us, our psychology is still a, a hunter-gatherer, tribal, intensely social psychology. And those mechanisms that allow us that close interpersonal uh, connection, those same mechanisms are used to generate religious beliefs and religious beliefs functions. One of the main uh, uses is uh, group bonding. And it can be, as I, as all of us here know, group bonding for the purpose of, of deadly violence. I guess this is a question slash sure. a token. Um, first of all, when I went to a to a counselor a while back, I was going through some struggles in life. Um, they talked about codependency, so I, I imagine codependency might have come out of these very tight bonds socially and depending on one another. That it can be unhealthy to some degree, probably depending on the kind of habits you have in that relationship. Would that come out of something like this? Or I think that's an excellent observation, and I'm I'm a minority view here. Okay. Um, but I think we have to be uh, careful about labeling things negatively, you know, uh, codependent. Mm -hmm. The reality is we are all codependent. We're right. all interdependent. Um, I'm sitting here today because of the work of innumerable people. Um, and, and we're all uh, still, even in the modern world, intensely uh, rely upon other people. Um, you know, we're, we're actually relying on the people who make the electricity happen here in Charlottesville. So, you know, the, the idea of the Marlboro man, the independent, to go it alone, is, is in a sense an unfortunate myth. And so I, I don't like negative labels like codependent. I mean, I think, you know, there are relationships that have problems. Yeah. Uh, and I think we have to, I think we have to avoid sort of uh, negative or critical pejorative labels. What that's... about monogamy? What about the idea of being with one? Because you know how animals are. Animals, mm -hmm. like kind of, they are kind of, they kind of have a polyamorous slash monogamy type of stance. Mm -hmm. And I feel naturally humans are like that. It's natural to see other women and be attracted as a guy at the same time, having your girl and, and, and vice versa. Did, did monogamy you think came out of our being socially like very close and tight knitted? Well, that's a, that's a, that's a really complicated uh, situation because it goes back uh, to a, a more basic difference between the sexes. It has to do with what's called parental investment. Anybody watching this who's interested, look up Robert Trivers parental investment, and there's a huge skew um, between the amount of parental investment that women have in offspring and the amount of parental investment that men have. And, um, and maybe let's, let's hold that for- Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Long hair goals, l vibe dream lengths, strengthens hair's length- Commercial. I'm getting ends. paid by playing my own video. Is somebody going to do an investigation to Christianity? Because it, well, but no, but it's it, no, it's an important question because again, I think a couple of things here that understanding evolutionary biology, understanding the concepts of evolutionary biology, understanding parental investment and the difference in parental investment in the sexes goes a long way to understanding the difference in sexual behavior between men and women of our species. Religion, one of the um, you know uses of religion is to control the reproductive resources of women. Think of the the Muslim women in Shadwar. Mm. Right, so religion gets heavily involved in trying to control women's sexuality. So it's, it is connected. 
Um, this creates something um, that is going to be important to understanding uh, religion, which is uh, mismatch theory. The mismatch between the environment we are uh, involved for and the environment that we live in today. Um, and, and again, always keep in mind that when you're talking about any, any fundamental human trait and even the fundamental structures as we'll see of religion and religious ritual, it goes back to our hunter-gatherer past on the savannas of Africa. And echoes of that, as I will show you, are even in our modern religions. Also, 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 also. Okay, okay. Um, Constellation Pegasus, I see you, I see you. If this guy ever comes back on, ask him if he thinks the wave function in quantum mechanics enables free will versus determinism. He's a psychologist, so I don't know. He might have an opinion about free will and determinism and what he thinks is going on. But uh, yeah, um, I will ask him. I have his number, but he's working today, so he can come on. And then Ronaldo says, do me a favor and no more of the hallelujah crap. It triggers the hell out of me. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to give you the true hallelujah when I do it. So I get that it triggers, but I am trying to get the hell out of you. And by giving you myth, vision, truth, not, not the phony fake stuff. So, uh, Ronaldo, amen. Is that okay? Is it cool if I say amen? I hope you're not upset. Thanks for the super chat. Seriously, Ronaldo. I really appreciate that. Let's get back to the presentation, everybody. Um, this is, uh, on, on your left, the skull of Homo erectus. On the right, uh, one of our skulls, Homo sapiens. And I put it up there to show you um, the differences and look particularly in this area, the frontal lobes. And one of the features of hominid evolution is the rapid growth in our brains, uh, rapid in evolutionary times, uh, in, in any sense of evolutionary time. Um, Lucy, Australopithecines, their, their brain, I think, was like 400 cubic centimeters uh, Homo habilis, it was maybe 800 cubic centimeters. I think ours is something like uh, 14 or 1500. We had very rapid brain growth, and particularly in the areas of the frontal lobe. So what drove that brain growth? Think about it. As, a, as a Homo, we had largely conquered the physical environment. You know, we had left Africa, gotten as far as Indonesia, uh, up into what is today um, the Caucasus Mountains, uh, cold climates. So even a couple of million years ago, we had conquered the physical environment. So what was the environment that was creating the natural selection pressures that drove this very rapid brain growth? Not the physical environment. So what was the environment that pushed this rapid, huge growth of our brains, particularly our frontal lobes? Well, it was each other, the interpersonal social environment and developing the social adaptations in our brain many of which reside in our frontal lobes that allow for this ultra-sociality, this ultra-cooperativeness. Bees, ants, uh, insects, um, what do they have? They have these uh, huge groups that are in intense cooperative networks. They have something that's called eusociality, right? And colony life, um, multi-generational care of the young, cooperative care of the young. Um, I have a one-year-old grandson. I'll gladly let you hold him. Right? The chimpanzee mother won't let her sister hold her baby. Right? So we, we take it for granted, but we have something that's unusual, this cooperative care of the young. We have division of labor. Um, think of the different jobs that we do uh, and do with each other, specialties that we have. Uh, we defend our group. We defend our local communal group. And we have self-sacrifice, which can lead to suicide. And maybe it is part of what even drives the suicide in our species. So we achieve eusociality, um, colony life, and this may be another secret to why we are the only surviving hominid. And this intense ultra-social uh, species. Why is this important? All right, we're gonna move away from uh, human evolution and I'm gonna start now to give you a taste for the mechanisms that generate religious beliefs. So religious ideas are byproducts of cognitive mechanisms that were originally designed for other purposes. Um, they are, in a sense, an artifact of our ability to imagine uh, different social worlds. They are always human concepts with just slight alterations. One of the things I want you to take away from this is that even the craziest of religious ideas is actually just one step away from everyday cognitive mechanisms. What's a byproduct? You know, what's the difference between an adaptation and a byproduct? 
Uh, because people will say, well, you know, religion is so strong, it couldn't just be a byproduct. Think about it for a moment. Reading and writing. Reading and writing is a cultural byproduct of biological adaptations. We have biological adaptations for vision. We have biologic adaptations for speech. Uh, we have a biological adaptation of language. We have a biological ad adaptation of fine motor movement, our hands. So reading and writing, we, we don't have reading and writing adaptations in our brain. You have to work hard for a few years to learn to read and write. Right. Reading and writing is a byproduct of these biologic cognitive mechanisms and I don't think anybody listening to this talk would say that reading and writing is a, is a small feature of humanity. It obviously is huge. You know, it has transformed us, right? Similarly, religion is a byproduct of these mechanisms, and obviously it has had huge impact on our species. Uh, if you've been to uh, a Pentecostal service uh, and people start speaking in tongues, what do they do? They reach up, right? They're, they're reaching up. If you've ever been around a one and a half or two year old who can walk, what do they do? They, they, they wobble over to you and they reach up wanting you to pick them up. That's one manifestation of the attachment bond, the attachment response. And our attachment system is very much involved in religion. When we're distressed, what do we do? We reach for an attachment figure. We reach for a caretaker. Anyone that's interested in this, I'd encourage you to look at an article that you can pull up on the web called On Becoming Attached by Robert Karen. The people that map this out, British psychiatrist John Bowlby, American psychologist Mary Ainsworth, and they mapped out the attachment system, which is a basic mammalian system, but they mapped out the attachment systems in humans. And we use it, obviously, in our love relationships, in our child care, in our friendships. The attachment bond is huge. The attach attachment system is huge. And religion uh, utilizes it, or I would say hijacks it. If I may, Dr. Thompson, Please. I think fascinating about this is I'm looking at myself when I see this image, because I, I used to be involved in non-denominational churches that spoke in tongues, but not just churches mm -hmm. that speak in tongues do this. We have some more conservative non-denominational or, or uh, non-speaking in tongues, non-charismatic churches that still have the praise and worship, and they still put hands up, or sometimes they do a different type of gesture. Um, but one of the points is, is Christian music in general, sometimes you can confuse the song for a loved one, like a spouse or a parent. And it's like almost like God is interchangeable with Absolutely. this social thing you're discussing, you're discussing here, which is fascinating. Absolutely. No, and, and, and thank you, because you're absolutely right. And it, it illustrates how the attachment system is used in that way. And the attachment system is, I would argue, in this case, hijacked mm -hmm. uh, for religious purposes. And, and it evokes it. And we'll talk. I, I just want to bring up that this, the recent interview I did when I responded to William Lane Craig, um, like just pointing out how fundamentally he has an emotional faith in Jesus and his experience. I played that clip from Darren Brown. Darren Brown literally tells you before he tricks this atheist into a religious experience a conversion, if you will. He tells you what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. I'm going to take her father figure in her life, and I'm going to posit it one step further to an agency, a godlike father that is all there, has an eye on everything and cares, just like her real father, because she had a good, uh, like a good hero type father in her, her life. So he just took a common, normal, natural thing one step away. And like modern Christian music is a huge one. How many of you have heard the song? Um, what is it? Uh, You're a good, good father. Something like that. I don't even know the rest of the words. It's something like that. But it starts out like that. What the heck, dude? <laughs> These are like real things we experience naturally because we have parents and we have these experiences. And it doesn't take but a step to put it into an imaginative place, giving agency to something beyond in our minds. And that is what I thought was so interesting about the approach he's taking. Consider that, like, why do we need the God if we know the mechanism and the natural tendency of how these things go? We had a critic in the chat earlier who's like, I don't know, They, you could tell when they're feeling like this is attacking the religion, and it's like, no, I know some Christians and I know more progressive people who would agree with everything I'm saying here. And they'd be like, yeah, 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 actually, I agree. I still think there's something. But if you could explain these things all naturally, and you could show why we believe, why do we think of gods, 
why do we come up with these concepts? And we can see the evolution of these things. It, it kind of starts to remove the job that God once had and gives God a different job. God used to be active and blasting the volcano and send the lightning down and doing all these things and was actively appearing. And then now it's like God lives and exists outside of space and time. There you go. You'll never be able to falsify that one. <laughs> Good luck. Good luck, buddy. So that's why I go to the ancient text and look at this stuff and find the evolution in it. All right. We got a couple super chats while I'm here. I'm glad you got me here. Evolution, uh, evangelical humanist. Sorry. I, I don't know why I said evolution. Evangelical humanist. I would love for you to get an anthropologist or sociologist on to share their thoughts on the social functions religious religions serve and how religions are shaped by cultural and social pressures. I would love to get one that explains this, taking a natural approach and can show these things. If you would email me some names, if you have any in mind, please do. I am about to be moving across the country, so I'll probably be there in like, let's say 10 days max. I'm driving over 3,000 miles with, with my wife to try and get to the new house on the West Coast. But um, when I get there, I'm going to hit the ground running. I'm going to be doing a lot of work. So for those of you who are patrons, you're going to be the like, patron members. You're going to see a ton of content start flowing in. Uh, thank you for that super chat for real. And I would love to talk with someone and learn from them about this. Also stop scamming, man. Hi, do you know if there's even been a person being born without the Fox P2 gene? And if so, what's this ailment called and how does it affect speech? You are asking the wrong guy. I could ask this if um, if uh, Dr. Thompson knows, I could email him after or message him after and see what he has to say if he does know, but I honestly don't know. I don't know. I really appreciate the super chat at Stop Scamming Man. If you want to follow up, email me as well. I can forward anything longer because I know we have a limited space through super chats and I, I could get that to him. Appreciate that super chat. Appreciate that. Uh, Logan Fisher... If you want an awesome primatologist, get guts and give in Erica to come on. She's amazing. Oh, you're not lying about that one. I've had Erica on multiple times. And um, I interviewed her in person, actually, when we were at the Texas Atheist Convention once. She is awesome. She is. Brilliant mind, and she's enthusiastic. She brings energy to the table. Thank you, Logan, for that super chat. I appreciate everyone. You thought he was with me? Yeah, that's okay. So you must have just come in. I am playing a clip I recorded with Dr. Thompson, and I am taking super chats, of course, while I'm here. But I will send it. I will send this to Thompson and see what he has to say. Plus, he's connected with a lot of other scientists, and so I'm guaranteeing you, if he doesn't have the answer, he's connected to other ones who do, because he's the one who put me on um, in connection with some of the other people. So, I appreciate that seriously. Here we go. Talk about one of the ways it gets supercharged at the chemical level, you know, religious rituals. I mean, that's one function of religious rituals is they supercharge this byproduct that is uh, religion. Wow. Um, uh, I want to talk here just for a minute about uh, byproducts, cultural byproducts, and uh, mismatch theory. Um, because the religion, the fundamental psychology of religion is the same as the fundamental psychology of junk food. It's also the same fundamental psychology as pornography. Right? And, and people feel that I'm being offensive. No, I'm being descriptive. And what I hope to show you is accurate description. Right? So what is junk food? Right? So all of us have cravings for sugar. Um, but sugar, the original sugar that we have cravings for, ripe fruit. Ripe fruit was a crucial source of calories and vitamin C, uh, and it was scarce. We had cravings for it. So whenever we had the opportunity, we ate it, right? And uh, what does the modern world give us? The modern world gives us sugar, refined sugar, Coca-Cola, brownies, cookies, and it's a super normal stimulus, right? Meaning when I eat uh, a peach, it's pleasurable. I get a little hit of dopamine. It's pleasurable, right? When I eat a brownie, bam, I get a big hit of dopamine. It is really nice, right? And I don't know about you all, but if I know there's a brownie downstairs, 
and a peach, which one am I going to wake up in the middle of the night and go get? A peach or a brownie? Obviously the brownie, right? Um, because it's a super normal stimulus that maps onto or hijacks an ancient mechanism. All of us have cravings for uh, fat, but it was the fat of lean game meat. And it was rare. It was a crucial source of proteins, crucial source of calories, but it was rare. In the modern world, we have this massively fat-laden meat that we can get every day, right? And it, it hijacks, you know, do I want, you know, lean game meat from a rabbit or do I want uh, a juicy steak? No, you know, no choice there. I'm going to go for <laughs> steak because it, it, it hijacks that ancient system with a super normal stimuli, right? We all have cravings for salt. Like, you know, the Big Mac meal, the French fries have got salt and they're soaked in meat juice, right? Okay, so you can see, I hope, that, a, that a, a Big Mac meal is a monument to your Stone Age inheritance. It is a cultural creation of the modern world and it, it, it hijacks, is based on and hijacks these ancient mechanisms, um, but uh, hijacks them with super normal stimuli, right? What's God? God, most gods in most religions are super normal caretakers. They're super normal attachment figures. You know, God the Father, right? But he's, he's, a, he's a more powerful father than our everyday ordinary fathers. But he's a powerful attachment figure that we reach up to. So, and if you think about pornography, pornography comes from males' sexual biases. You know, males are drawn to markers of youth, fertility, and pornography. Uh, gives it to us in super normal stimuli. I love this slide. Somebody sent it to me. <laughs> um, now, I, this one is crucial. Uh, and it goes into our sense of an afterlife, for instance. We have something called decoupled cognition. And these are fancy terms where I hope you will see every ordinary, everyday ordinary mechanisms that you've been using the whole time you've listened to us. So what is real quick coming back to these super chats here. Stop skimming man said no of Lee Berger or Berger. He's incredibly cool. Having dramatically discovered Arthropithecus or Lepithecus Sabida. I hope I'm saying that right. And homo Nalito. He's loads of cool content on YouTube. I just looked him up and I'm going to try and message, try and email this guy. But I also need to make sure I get where I'm going. That's the problem. When I start emailing, I am headstrong on working from dark to dark. And so once I say, hey, I'm available next Tuesday, I don't even know my forecast on the future right now because it's such a hectic uh, time I'm in right now with trying to sell this house and move and things like that. So um, help me out. If you don't mind, this is what I love about our, our fans here and those who follow Myth Vision. Like I, you guys know more than me in many ways on so many things. I like to learn from you. And I ask that you email me. Email me some of these scholars who show those natural approaches, show us the science, right? I'm all about what can we actually know, what can we test and look at, things like that. So really, please do that for me. And then oh, Flamio. Derek, I watched Joseph Smith Magic and Occult Timeline of Early Mormonism Part 1, David Fitzgerald and Bryce. Why is it so hard to find religions in the occult phase when it is still cool? I don't know. That's an interesting question. That is an interesting question. Have you watched the rest of the series too, by the way? I was in love with the story of Joseph Smith and getting into it. By the end... Like midway through, you're like this horrible guy. And then you're like, it's like um, any TV show you get lost in and you're watching and one of the guys is like bad but good. And like there's this tug of war going on. At the end, you're like, damn, I got to say goodbye to this person. But I'm fascinated with how Mormonism evolves and becomes what it is. And maybe we can look at examples like Mormonism. It's a bit projecting, but like – if we see how human behavior acts in the way that the development of the cult is, I always wonder if there is some comparison to Paul or even Jesus with Joseph Smith. This has been something I've always wanted to like find out more data. Can we find naysayers who said something about these guys? And um, I wonder if there's a comparison there. I really do. 
But Oflamio, thank you so much. I hope you watch the rest of the series. And I think I have one or two videos that are still on my Patreon that I have not made public that were part of the series. Arabian Princess would be great if you could get Anthony Rogers on your show so he can explain all you need to know about the one true God. Who is Anthony Rogers? Let me look this person up. Anthony Rogers. Okay. Oh, you're talking about the Christian apologist guy. Yeah, he's a reformed Calvinist. I've listened to him before in the past. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, if I talked to him, it would be more about like picking apart and having conversations on where I fall, where he falls. But he's within the reformed camp. He's within the the complete reform tradition. And so it would be like getting another Calvinist on to have these conversations. And uh, yeah, I don't know what the point would be on having him on other than to wrestle with our differences and things like that. But uh, yeah, he's not even like a PhD in the field or anything like that. He's just a Christian apologist who's read a lot of material, but mainly focused within the Christian tradition. So I, I think, I don't know if there's sarcasm or if you really do think that like he has it right about God and whatnot, but uh, yeah, I definitely don't think he's right about that. I'm, I, I appreciate the super chat though. I always enjoy seeing you in the chat and uh, coming in and being kind and stuff like that. I just don't see what they have to offer at this point. I came out of a tradition like what he's in. Stop scamming, man. Thank you again for the super chat. Everyone knows of the Australopithecus Lucy, even creationists know a far more com complete specimen called Littlefoot is criminally under the radar. Wow. I definitely want to hear about this because I've heard about Lucy. In fact, I think I had uh, got to given on to talk about Lucy. And in, in one of those talks, she went into it at least. Let me see something here. Hold on. Pedro says, Derek, for the sake of the argument, your stream title is clickbait. This is not science. This is speculation. And based on psychology, which is not hard science at all, hope you take this well. All right. Paul Thomas says, great work, Derek. Please do continue to bring in experts in the neuroscience, psychology, and sociology of religious adherents, i.e. Robert Sapolsky, and I will not butcher the name. I will, and I will email these people, and I do appreciate that. Yes, thank you so much. Yeah, Logan, you missed it, but it's there. There's multiple interviews I've done with her on Myth Vision, so go check out those interviews. I did a long one talking about uh, conspiracy theory Robert Seffer, but uh, yeah, thank you for uh, everybody, all the support. We'll get back to the video here, and uh, you tell me if what this guy's saying isn't scientific uh, after watching this, and let me know what you think. Is decoupled cognition. We can decouple our cognition in time and place. As hard as you may have been working, listening to me, I will guarantee you that while you've been listening to me, there have been moments where you have remembered a conversation with somebody else, or you're thinking about a conversation you're going to have to have with somebody else, right? So we get salon hair at home, validated by colorist. Also, Ever also, salon treatments also, by L'Oreal. The great Come on now, commercials. In here and even out here, all there we go. can decouple from the present moment, go to the past, we can go to the future. We can go to a different place. Right now, I could ask all of you to imagine in your head a conversation with President Biden. You can do it just like that. You'll notice at the beginning of my talk, I said, you know, if you were to run into Mr. Jefferson next week, and not one of you listening to this talk said, wait a second, that you know, that, that's impossible. You sort of knew it was impossible, but you could imagine, you know, right now, running into Mr. Jefferson and having a conversation with him. Mm -hmm. I can decouple from this moment in time and this place, wherever you're sitting right now, and you can go to another time and another place and have a complicated social interaction. The conversation with President Biden would be complicated, right? And you could also, you could ask President Biden for something and promise him something in return. Reciprocity, another one of our mechanisms. What's prayer? Dear God, I will do this for you if you will do this for me. You know, if you will save, if you will save so and so, I will donate to your works, right? 
a complicated social interaction uh, in a different place at a different time with an unseen other, but the standard you know, complicated conversation. So that's one aspect of decoupled cognition. The other part is um, the decoupling between how we experience thoughts and feelings, our mind, and how we experience our body. Now, I want to illustrate this uh, this way. Um, imagine that this is your brain, right? Okay, so this is this is your brain right here. This is the frontal lobe of your brain right here, okay? Now, we're going to cut it in half, and this is the medial, what's called the medial or the midline of your brain, right? And this middle of your brain right here, right? Um, this is in the midline is where you experience your own thoughts and feelings and where you experience other people's thoughts and feelings. What the slide shows you, all those dots are in the midline, midline of the frontal lobe. And that's where you have self-knowledge, um, where you're thinking about other people's minds, your own mind, mentalizing. That's basically think mind and everything that goes into mind, medial frontal lobe. Okay. Okay. Now, the outside of your brain, so here's our, here's our right hemisphere, right half of our brain. Okay, the out, outward layers, particularly here in the frontal motor strips, this is where we perceive our bodies and other people's bodies. So anything that has to do with bodies is separate from what has to do with mind. Mind and body are separated in our brain's perception of it. It's called decoupled cognition. Cognition meaning obviously awareness. So the awareness of mind, my own mind, your mind, the awareness of my own body, your body, decoupled in different areas of the brain. And again, you can ask, well, Andy, why are you going through all this? Right? Because this is crucial. That dualism, we thought mind and body, mind and brain are separate. They're not. The brain represents minds and bodies in separate neural systems, separate neural circuits. So we experience and believe minds and bodies are separate categories, despite clear evidence to the contrary. My brain, if it's damaged, I lose both awareness of mind and body, right? But our experience, our moment-to-moment -moment daily experience is that they are separate. So. Real quick, coming back to you all. Got a couple of super chats I want to make sure I get. I promised I would get to your super chats if you sent them. Daniel Whitaker, if you don't try for Sarah and Mari Walker, you're doing a disservice to humanity and to yourself. So I just searched her up, and she is an American theoretical physicist and astrobiologist within research interest in the origins of life, astrobiology, physics of life, emergence, complex and dynamical systems, and artificial life. Walker is currently deputy director of the Beyond Center for Fundamental Concepts and Science at Arizona State University. I'm going to have to email her. Sounds like origins of life and stuff too is a really interesting topic. Let's see if she'll let me uh, get some airtime with her. I really appreciate the mention, Daniel. I think I've heard of her before, but I may even have emailed her in the past and had no success. So I will be more than happy to try again. Thank you so much for that. Really appreciate the support. Uh, Constellation Pegasus says, you need to read the book Black Rednecks and White Liberals by Thomas Sowell. Sowell? This book will blow your mind. You need to interview Thomas Sowell, or however you pronounce Thomas's last name. And this is a 1930s author, uh, economist, political commentator, social theorist, and senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. And um, interesting. I Is it... Like a book that's easy to read here? Because uh, in the midst of moving, I'd love to listen to some books. Constellation, thank you for that. Make sure you message me if there's like a way to get the book uh, on Audible or something so that I'm driving, I can listen. Mr. Monster, do we know of any primates that worship gods, kind of like the monkey that shakes his fist at the lightning strike? This is a good question. I wish I could ask like a, a primatologist or someone who's in the field and understands how the social construct of monkeys and whatnot work, whether they're chimpanzees or whatever they might be. Um, it would be interesting to know, like, do they have a funny type of tradition? We have a specific thing we, we worship and we have God, right? We go to church, we have a particular religious practice and whatnot. Do monkeys carry anything like that? That would be a really interesting thing to dive into. I don't know. 
I don't know the question. I don't know the answer to that question, but that would be a good uh, question to ask. And in fact, I'm going to message that as well to Dr. Um, Thompson today. I'll text him and, and see what he has to say about it. Appreciate that, Mr. Monster. And thank you for being once again, a member of true salvation myth vision. Oh snap. Oh snap. Pocket locker 86 J in the house. Look at the trees. Great show. Much love, my friend. So uh, Jay over here, he's got a YouTube channel. Go subscribe to Pocket Locker 86. Jay is a two-time PhD, and he is an expert on evolution, biology, you know? Like, he knows what he's talking about when it comes to evolutionary biology. And, of course, I'm sure you know much more than that, Jay. So I definitely need to get, like, a checklist of your credentials. But, uh... Uh, we're going to have an episode. You, me, and Erica from Guts at Gibbon are going to talk about evolution. We're going to come on here and we're going to like just tear it down. We need to do PowerPoint, honestly. Like what's going on here with Andy Thompson. We need a PowerPoint presentation, bounce between PowerPoint and then our faces and like really prove based on the evidence and facts, evolution is a theory, scientifically speaking. It's a fact. Like the, the point is, it's true, and we need to get over it. We need to stop pretending like it's not. Um, I didn't believe it. I did not. Someone said, make Derek. Titan Uranus said, make Derek say my name. <laughs> Good to see you, Titan. Good to see you in the chat, in the chizzy. Yes. You know what? I need to... Uh, I need to text her. I've got her number. I need to ask her that question about like, are there funny traditions that apes and chimpanzees practice or, or is there a habit that they have that kind of equates to what humans call religion and the way that we practice? It's a good question to ask. Titan Uranus, let's get started again back on the show. Think about, let's, let's flip it for a second. So think about if I had to have Derek in front of me to think about what is going on in his mind, to wonder um, what he wants, what he would like in this presentation, um, what his questions might be. If I had to have Derek sitting literally in front of me, you know, that would be, that would be very difficult. Right? But even before meeting Derek, I can think about what he might want. And so I hope you can see that a belief, just an operating belief in some form of life separate from the experience of a body that's just our basic day-to-day -day, you know, setting of our brain. That's the default setting of our brain is the split between mind and body. Mm. Right? So um, I'm getting to the age where many of those near and dear to me have died. Um, I can still have conversations with them in my head, as I will occasionally do. For a moment, think about it. Think about somebody who you have loved deeply, loved deeply, who is now uh, deceased, who's passed. And I ask you to call up a conversation with them. I can. You can do it instantly. Mm -hmm. Instantly. You can have a, co a conversation with somebody who's gone. Um, <clears throat> you think about it, that's just one small step to ancestor worship. Wow, that's true. Right. And it's just, it's not, it's, you can see, I hope, that it's not very hard to imagine a God, a man, uh, or a woman, but obviously gods have mostly been men. You can imagine a god, a man, who's out there, who has a mind of his own, who you can communicate with or propitiate or submit to. Uh, and you can see that it, it, it's actually just one small step from the mechanism I asked you to use in talking to Mr. Jefferson or talking to President Biden or it, to talking to the person who you have lost. I think it's interesting that I had this conversation yesterday with Dr. Robert Price, who's also an atheist, of course. And, uh, and I said, it's amazing when what theists have done, of course, is when the arguments and the evidence becomes clearer and we have a natural explanation for things, they always step up that level uh, to try and compete with the natural view. And so right now, I think the most, I guess you'd say the best argument for theism that I've heard, for example, is that, well, we have minds and that we have intelligence to some degree. We can, we can, you know, we have a coordination of the world and reality around us. 
the world around us has pattern and some form of structure, even though there's chaos at the same time. Uh, therefore, there must be a mind like us one step further. We have a mind, so there must be a mind. And that's like the best argument, not labeling what religion or whatnot. But I can see how we would easily concoct the idea yeah. without yeah. necessarily having any evidence for it. We just have to say, well, there's patterns and and things seem to measure in certain ways. There are certain laws of, of nature. Therefore, there's got to be a mind behind those laws that create the. You see where I'm going with right, this. Right. And exactly. And, and, and um, it's just one small step from what we're doing all the time. Uh, there, there's a conflict going on in, in my job at the Student Health Service. There are three different people involved. Yeah, I don't know that one right there, if you think about it and, and how we keep talking about one step further every bit of this, all the religions and things, the concepts, God, et cetera, are just that step further of natural mechanisms we already have. So it's harder to not believe than it is to believe. It's harder not to believe than it is to believe because all of the mechanisms for belief are natural. They come natural and we practice them on a day-to-day -day basis. We're just taking it a step further when we posit a God. Um, just want to make a quick comment, Mr. Anderson, who's the newcomer competing with whom? When I mentioned theism is uh, competing with when we come up with the scientific understanding or finally explain something naturally. Um, I think the point is, is like theists are obviously trying to at first resist. And then when it becomes overwhelmingly evidential, it's still there's resistance in some crowds. It's like, OK, fine. How do we make this fit Genesis? How do we make sure that our science matches and goes along with our with our religious beliefs so we don't look silly while we keep our beliefs? And every religion that has come after another religion, every one of these religions is in some way trying to be superior to the previous one. So we talk about what comes later. Like I, I think the point is a scientific inquiry, the way that we actually are inquiring about science and approaching the stuff skeptically is late in the day in comparison. And I'm with you for sure. Even though atheists have been around for a long time, they definitely were not even close to the majority. I don't even know the kind of percentage you could put on people because all people just granted it or were skeptical of certain claims, but still positive there was something out there or whatever, because that comes natural to the mind. And I think the more we learn, the more we realize, okay, why are we believing in something with no data, no we have no evidence. What we have is our own experiences, but then we posit beyond that something more. And that's, I think, the interesting thing that he's bringing up in this lecture. Everything is just a step further, and you already have ancestor worship. Step further, and you have God. Raising your hands up to praise God, it's like psychologically asking God to pick you up, just like little infants raise their arms up to their parents, to their father. Pick me up, Daddy. You know, that is kind of what I'm seeing, like I'm witnessing it. I used to do it in church myself. So it's just a, a lot of fun stuff to consider. Let's continue. And, you know, I can instantly right now think of the various things going on in those three people's minds and the potential uh, arguments about uh, one particular patient. And I, you know, it's a very detailed, complicated thing between um, actually, you know, three different minds. Mm. They're not here right now, and I can decouple myself right now from this place and this time and think about what they're thinking and what they're going to be thinking next week when there's a meeting on Monday about it and how it's going to affect me. Mm. <laughs> you know, and, and those are multiple minds operating on very specific, complicated issues. You know, and, and we do that all the time. And uh, the people who uh, eventually watch this, if they'll step back for a moment, hit pause, and, I'll, and think about while they were listening, just every now and then, my guess is they went to a complicated conversation with somebody that they've got to have this week or next week or remembering a conversation in order to think about a conversation next week. These are and, and we just take this for granted. Mm -hmm. um, but these are these are things that evolved over evolutionary time. And we don't have a good time sense. We can sort of imagine our grandparents generation, but it's just it's just impossible to get our minds around, you know, our ancient ancestors. And, and these capacities took a long time to evolve and become automatic. We just take them for granted. But they're actually extremely complex. I, I think one of the problems in artificial intelligence is they've yet to be able to fully um, uh, program something that can do all of what our minds can do. Again, why this is important is this obviously leads very easily to a belief in the afterlife. Uh, this is a, a, from a grave in what is today Israel. And it's uh, uh, a young adolescent 
who died and buried. And clearly they thought he was going to the afterlife somewhere. They, they put some animal horns uh, with him and uh, you know, our species and Neanderthals uh, uh, grave sites had things. Super chat. Super, super chat. Caleb Jackson in the house, my Christian friend here. Yes, I put Christian friend. I want our audience to know you're a Christian. I do that, don't I? I didn't call you an apologist this time. But uh, Caleb Jackson, all of the beliefs we have, including our senses, come about through evolution. If we can trust our senses to survive, can we trust our sense of God? And this is an interesting point. Like, um, our tr like for example, our senses lead us to want that brownie. In the earlier point of his video, we have a sense for sugar, and it's a heightened ecstatic sense of giving us more than probably what we should. So we go a little beyond what we're supposed to, and obesity can come from that. There are other harms that can come from the natural mechanisms we already have. We just go a little bit beyond that, and next thing you know, we're overweight. We have diseases start to come on, even when it comes to sex. Uh, other things, there's all sorts of different things, and they're all natural. But we go just a little bit further. Next thing you know, we're in a deep hole. And so can we trust our sense of about God or that? I, I guess, yes, we could. If you believe that that is God, what you're experiencing is God. If we can explain those mechanisms naturally and show that that's just the human experience, that your feelings about a parent or a father figure or whatever it may be in your particular imagination and mind through your actual experiences and you put it onto God, I mean, yeah, you could you could say, hey, that feels real and that seems real to me. But you actually have your parents. You have these actual natural manifestation of things we can touch and feel and see and experience. And those, I would say, are evidential. Whereas when we get to the idea of God, if you take the conclusion that Dr. Thompson's saying here and pointing out, which it's not just him, it's like many of the scientists in the field, you're just going a step beyond. You're assuming agency beyond that. And I don't think uh, it's necessary to take that conclusion. So I don't know if that made sense in the response, but I had plenty of senses and experiences about God. And I don't take away those experiences. I think those experiences were real experiences that I had. But I now understand that these experiences were probably from my social settings, probably from my environment, the kind of message that's being given to me. Like, I don't see, you know, they say, uh, what is, what's the particular verse that says uh, salvation comes through preaching of the gospel and sending someone out. They need to preach the gospel in order for people to be saved. Like, if you don't hear the words of the gospel, if you don't know the story, if you don't know that, you won't be saved. So there's missionaries. You got to be sent to, to hear it. There's a lot of psychological narration going on into these stories, and they're giving you these things. I just personally don't think the sense of God is provable or justified when we actually know why we would jump to these conclusions naturally. I just don't see why we would jump to the conclusion that God exists from that. That's my thoughts. But I hope that answers. I mean, people you know, trust their senses all the time. In fact, you could talk to people who have visions, right? You, you look into this stuff all the time. They have visions, but we would call them in the category of probably hallucinations or something to that effect. They really believe in their experience and that is true. Now, some people recognize their own experience was a hallucination. Their mind played tricks on them or whatever. Others don't. And they think that this is real and it's true and it is what it is. Now, I know some people who are spiritual minded people who will take those experiences we call hallucinations and they will say, no, 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 that was real. Or like, I know a guy who's into some really off the wall psychological stuff. He tells people that um, schizophrenia and those voices in your head, that's not like a mental illness. Those are real demons and voices in their head. They're actual spiritual entities. And they, he wants to teach them how to wrestle with those voices, which are spiritual entities, without having to take the medicine that doctors are trying to prescribe people who are diagnosed with these types of mental health issues. And there are dangers in that. The church never told me I had a disease and that alcoholism and drug addiction were real, natural manifestations of things I needed to help myself with. 
They told me I had a spiritual malady, that it was demonic and evil. They never gave me a scientific remedy. Once I found out I had a problem and that I wasn't a bad human being, that's when it really started to get me. So, Caleb, I love you, brother. Thank you for the super chat. I hope uh, my answer makes sense. Pseudo cellos. Uh, am I saying that right? The physical world is less real than God. Since God is where beings come from, don't be fooled by scientism. I mean, that's like the uh, ayahuasca uh, shamans down in South America who will take ayahuasca and they do it so often. They divorce their wives in the real world to marry the women that they met in the ayahuasca trip. Because the psychedelic realm is more real than this one. I mean, prove it wrong. The physical world is less real than God. That's a scary, um, I think that's a scary approach. Like imagine people running around believing this world isn't really real or it's really that God is real. Like it's the reverse of using an empirical method in my opinion, because this is all fake and phony. I don't know. It's it's Maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're saying, but- I think that's really guesswork. I don't, I, that's like making a huge assumption. I don't know. I don't know. Someone help me with that one. Inquisitive mind. If you follow the golden rule, treat people the way you'd like to be treated, you would need no religion. This is true. But I think we learned that through experience. That golden rule, which Jesus taught, was also there well before. Um, Jesus, this is something in the Greek world, the golden rule, something that was already being to told philosophers, if we will, they've been talking about that. And Jesus, of course, is also in the same vein. All right, back to the show. Um, I hope I'm making any sense here. Let's continue. Things in them that indicated people believed that, um, they were going someplace else. And I hope you can see that it's very easily conceived of. We can very easily think of another place that's populated by minds, that the idea of an afterlife is very easy. And one of the other reasons is the mechanism for uh, thinking about other people's minds never really turns off. I know my parents are dead. I know their bodies are dead. But you know, the mechanisms for thinking about their minds never turns off. So I can easily have a conversation with them. I, it, it's very easy to think of them being alive in another place. Um, this is the modern version of uh, belief in heaven. Uh, Pop-up is now in the cloud, sweetheart. Yep. Uh, sky daddy. Yeah. <laughs> but so you can, you can see you know, how easy it is for human mind to conceive of an afterlife, a heaven, a place, a place that's populated by people we know and love. Something else that's important to religion is our ability to just fill in the blanks. Um, we see this as a square, but if you look closely, there, there's no line for the square, but we see the square, we just fill in the blanks. And this goes into a phenomenon called um, minimally counterintuitive worlds, MCIs, we fill in the blanks. What does this mean? If, if you think about a big old oak tree that is somewhere in your community, and I tell you that that big old oak tree can do your taxes, um, can uh, reprogram your computer, um, can uh, play chess with you. Uh, you're, you're simply not going to believe it. Um, it's just too many violations of treeness, right? It's just, there's just, it's just completely off the charts. But if I tell you that that tree on the night of a full moon can hear your request, hear your prayer. All of us are vulnerable to believe that um, because there's just one small violation of treeness and that small violation is a basic human capacity, you know, listening to a request. Right? And all of us are vulnerable to believe that. And this is true of all supernatural beliefs. They are called MCIs, minimally counterintuitive worlds. Right? And it's because there is something uh, attention arresting, something memorable. Um, it, it, because there's just there's it, you know something we're deeply familiar with, but one small twist that is something human, and it's this sort of optimal compromise between something that's interesting, but everything that is expected. Right? And MCIs are crucial to uh, religious beliefs. Um, uh, let's let's take uh, something before we get to religious beliefs. 
one of my favorite movies as of all time, really, and certainly as a child, was The Wizard of Oz. And that's a magical movie for most people who, who see it. If you haven't seen it, uh, um, I strongly encourage it. Wonderful movie. And its power comes from the, the, in a sense, supernatural agents are basically just men with one slight twist. The scarecrow. Another commercial snap. Crow, he's looking for a brain. The cowardly lion is looking for courage. And the tin man is looking for a heart. But otherwise, they're just men. And everything about men, you just fill in the blanks. And you don't question. But there's just one slight twist on something that is human. And it's memorable. It's attention arresting. And clearly, they've got a great attachment system. Dorothy becomes attached to them. Um, they're looking for the Wizard of Oz, the father. Um, the supernatural templates in The Wizard of Oz are very powerful, um, but they're all these MCIs, and that's true of any fairy tale that we remember and any fairy tale that is religion. So there are a, a counterintuitive physical property. So, you know, God is everywhere. He's still a guy, but he's everywhere, right? Or there's one slight counterintuitive piece of biology. The Virgin Mary was a virgin. She conceived a very natural human phenomena. She was a virgin, one small twist. There's an, a counterintuitive psychology. Now think about it, the Christian God knows what I'm thinking, right? Knows, what, knows whether I've been naughty or nice. He knows what I'm thinking. But if he knows why, what I'm thinking, if he knows what I'm thinking, why do I still have to pray to him? Why do I have to have a normal human conversation? Right? <laughs> so there's just this one little twist that's attention arresting, but still everything about humans uh, and human mental states and ordinary human capacities is still there. They're just taken for granted. We don't even think about them. Um, the poet, Shelley, I think put it well. I'll let you all read it. There is no attribute of God which is not either borrowed from the passions and powers of the human mind or which is not a negation. So, you know, religions always have some piece of human mental state embedded in it. You know, some little twist, but all the fundamentals of human emotional states, mental states are there. Now, I, I do want to stop uh, for a second here. Hold on what one I've, second. What I've done. All right. I do need to get this super chat because people are waiting in and they can't get to heaven. They're in this torture place in between if they don't get their super chats. Um, but also, like, what I think keeps happening is we're putting, you know, we, big cart, right? The, the cart before the horse. And uh, it sounds to me like there's always an answer back. Well, the reason why there's this human tendency is because. God wants to make sure the human agent knows how to access him and stuff. And it's, it, it's always this like, it sounds like you could put it backwards and it's really God that did these things first, rather than saying the evolution of these ideas and God is something that we have come up with because of our mental capacity and our natural functions. All of this is a reflection of what I would say is actually the case. And we've done a lot of science. You cut someone's head off, they no longer experience. They're no longer thinking. They can't process these things. The world around them, I see no reason to think, exist in their minds because they aren't working anymore. This is that whole idea of like consciousness exists outside of the brain and things like that. And I know this gets lost into a debate, but this is my personal, uh, where I sit on this is that like listening to some of the scientists that I've talked to who understand the brain and what consciousness is, these conversations, it really makes me kind of go, why are we thinking that there's before they're born, there's something, or maybe their soul or mind or their consciousness comes into being, or it's recycled consciousness that they end up getting. When their brain stops working, they're not as conscious anymore. They're, they're losing that. I don't know why we jump that God of the gaps kind of argument of wanting consciousness to precede or be outside of, the human experience, the brain that we experience. Um, and earlier for the super chat that I was confused about talking about this reality isn't as real. I think they were getting into like platonic philosophy and that there are like truer states of forms and whatnot in heaven. And this is something that obviously I don't agree with either. If it were true, then that'd be interesting, but I don't, I don't jump to that conclusion. I'm kind of starting with the more ground up what our experience senses and measurable testable things we can go from work from there does that mean there are things that we can't test that might exist maybe i just don't jump to that conclusion because i know 
all of these natural things he's describing in this entire interview are normal. And we jump to those. We literally make that leap. And if we make that neat leap naturally and we go back in history and see that even the understandings of gods or the ideas of these things have changed over time, why aren't we seeing at one point maybe we didn't believe in those? Maybe we had a completely different concept that helped us survive in the world and assuming agency and things. I don't know. I don't know why we don't do that. Doc Pleromonot, reach out to Bill Von Hippel. hope I'm saying that right. Excellent guest and great book. The Social Leap Require Reading for My Undergrads. The Social Leap. I just looked up and I found Professor Bill Von Hippel, Fellow Association of Psychological Science, Doctor of Philosophy, University of Michigan, Bachelor of Arts, Yale University. Hmm. The Better, the better to Fool You With, Deception and Self-Deception, journal article, Darwinian Grandparenting Redux, a pre-registered uh, replication and extension, and then irrelevant insights make worldviews ring true. Hmm. This sounds like fun. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Appreciate the super chat. Always love uh, hearing from you. Always love hearing from you. All right. Let's get it. Let's get it back on here. And so far is just, I hope, give you a taste. That's just a taste for the everyday ordinary cognitive mechanisms that we use to be the extraordinary social species that we are, those mechanisms go into religious belief. The religious belief, like reading and writing, is this cultural creation. It's a byproduct of these mechanisms. They arise from these mechanisms. And then there's a cultural creation that comes back at those mechanisms in a super normal way that really triggers strong feeling. They're attention arresting. They're memorable. And they hijack those systems. My attachment system is hijacked to be you know, connected to a God or to Jesus or the Virgin Mary. What I want to do now, I've shown you, I hope, some of those mechanisms. There are others. Theory of mind mechanisms, hyperactive agency detection uh, mechanisms. And this is why religion is so powerful, because there's, there's a list of at least 20 different mechanisms. Mm. Every ordinary day cognitive mechanisms that go into religion, that religion creates a cultural uh, uh, narrative about and they come back with super normal stimuli not the cognitive method now how how do those how do those super normal stimuli get supercharged you know how do how do you put high octane fuel into those mechanisms and that's what i want to turn to next in the last part of the talk which is about religious ritual right? and religious ritual religion comes from relegary to bind and religious ritual intensifies that uh, bonding and other things <clears throat> One of the, to me, interesting things, and part of why I, I um, went over human evolution is that Nicholas Wade, um, uh, the New York Times, former New York Times religion, uh, I'm sorry, former New York Times science editor, wrote a very interesting book called The Faith Instinct. And he makes a very powerful case that we see the original religion. Uh, we see the original religion in human beings. We, we, can, we can see what it is. And then we can see the echoes in modern day religions. And he points out that the Kung San of Africa, the Kung San live uh, on the southeast coast of Africa. It's thought to be a window into deep history. This is a window into the environment that shaped us, that we evolved in. So the Kung San's religion, um, and this is just, uh, you know, shows you one of their ritual. The Kung San, southeast coast of Africa, the Andaman Islands. And I meant to point it out when I was showing the, the map of where we went, look up Andaman Islands. They're off of the east coast of India. And the Andaman Islands have tribes that basically were untouched. So the 19th century and, and remain largely untouched to this day, now protected by the uh, Indian government. And so the Andaman Islands were probably uh, settled 60,000 years ago. Uh, the Andaman Islanders and the Aborigines of Australia. and um, Australia was the Aborigines settled there about 60,000 years ago. Now, what's important about that is that the religions of the, the Kung San, the Andaman Islands, and the Aborigines are almost identical. And Wade argues that why that is the case is because we are seeing the original religion of Homo sapiens that Homo sapiens had in Africa when they left Africa and started to move around the world. They took it with them. And we still see it in close to pure form in the Kung San, the Andaman Islanders, 
and the Aborigines. And, and, and as I'll show you, I hope, even echoes of it in modern day Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Buddhism. What is that first religion? That first religion is largely based on song and dance, right? There are no priests or ecclesiastical hierarchy. One of the, one of the things that religion does is it puts everybody on the same level. Um, it's the entire community. So any distinction by rank or social hierarchy is temporarily um, uh, uh, moves to the side. And it is centered on constant rhythmic physical activity, song and dance, right? Why? Um, and here's the reason. Unbeknownst to them, our ancestors uh, utilized neurotransmitters in our brain that are very, very powerful. Um, serotonin in the upper left. Serotonin is the oldest monoamine neurotransmitter. The monoamine neurotransmitters are serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. Okay? Serotonin, uh, when you go out and exercise, you get boosts in serotonin. Prozac, our modern antidepressants, boost serotonin. When you get a boost of serotonin, what are the things that happen? Your self-esteem improves, one thing. You get a boost in serotonin, your focus goes outward from inward. So you feel better about yourself and you're more outwardly focused. Serotonin is also involved in complicated thinking. Norepinephrine, um, that's adrenaline. Obviously adrenaline, you know, uh, really turns on our, think about when you get really excited, you know, you, you know, your antenna get, you know, hard, you know, they get really wired. They get, you know, you get excited. That's norepinephrine, adrenaline. Dopamine, what's dopamine? Dopamine is the pleasure chemical. When, when, when you eat that brownie, boom, you get a big hit of dopamine. But everybody tends to think of it as just the pleasure chemical. I want to change your mind here. Dopamine is much more powerful. Dopamine is what goes into focus, attention, motivation, concentration. Dopamine and norepinephrine are crucial with marking things as important that go into our memory. So the things that you remember from this talk today have been charged with dopamine and norepinephrine so, so that they uh, are boosted in physical activity. Um, oxytocin, everybody's probably heard of oxytocin. Oxytocin is the trust hormone. Right? And uh, one of the things we'll talk about is just, you know, wanted touch triggers oxytocin, but the boost in oxytocin, uh, trust. Endorphins, everybody's probably heard of endorphins. These are our own internal morphine, right? So um, they help blunt pain. And, and uh, the runner's high is, you know, part endorphin. But, endorphins main mechanism, or not the main mechanism, but one of the, probably its main importance is endorphins are involved in bonding, probably more so than oxytocin. And what our ancestors literally stumbled into were mechanisms that boosted all these neurotransmitters at once to create intense group bonding. Um, music, not when we listen to music, but when we make music. When we sing, when we make music, we boost endorphins. Uh, this is Darwin's uh, statement about music. I'll let you all read it. I conclude that musical notes and rhythm were first acquired by the male or female progenitors of mankind for the sake of charming the opposite sex. The musical tones became firmly associated with some of the strongest passions in animals capable of filling. Darwin, The Descent of Man. Yeah. And think of love songs. You know, so much of music is, is for uh, romance. But music also is for bonding. And when we make music, we are triggering that endorphin system. It reminds me of animals that make a calling with certain noises. They purposely right. heighten their tones or, you know, whatever it might be. Right. It's got this release of something, I suspect, that draws in the opposite sex. Yeah, yeah. they're courtship. Absolutely. And, 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 and uh, it, it's triggering endorphins. It's triggering bonding. <clears throat> um, this is one of my favorite experiments. Uh, again, to show you. Um, what is at the base of a religious ritual? So there's a group in England, and they did this experiment. How many of you have been to a gym where you have it in your home, a rowing machine, an ergometer? And I hope everybody knows what that is. These are rowing, indoor rowing machines. So what they did was the following. They put uh, people together, like the four people in the upper picture. They put people uh, together rowing, right? And they also had people rowing solo, just by themselves in er on an ergometer. And so they take the person that's rowing solo on the ergometer, and because you can measure work output, they, they measure work output on the ergometer, and then they measure pain threshold. You can, you can, you can get accurate uh, measures of people's pain thresholds using uh, blood pressure cuffs. 
And so you're on an ergometer, your row set work output, you measure your pain threshold. Then the person is put with other people and they're rowing synchronously, right? And they can control for work output. So they know it's the same level of work output that they had when they were rowing single, they're rowing you know, together. And then they measure pain threshold, same work output. But what happens when they measure pain threshold? The pain threshold has gone up. They don't feel as much pain. Same work output, but they're doing it synchronously with others. Just synchronous movement with other people, and you're getting a hit of endorphins. Your pain threshold goes up. Increased endorphins, increased bonding. Beautiful experiment. Right. Oh, one other experiment. If, imagine for a moment that we're all actually in an auditorium. There's 200 people in the auditorium. And we randomly divide the 200 people into two groups. And one of the groups is just asked to walk around the building three times. So the other group is asked to walk around the building three times, but to walk in lockstep, like soldiers marching, right? And they're gonna walk in lockstep three times around the building, other group just walk around the building. Then they bring them back. back and they have each group play what are called economic trust games that measure how quickly you trust other people. What happens? Okay, and the only difference is marching synchronously. The group that marks synchronously, they trust each other much better, much quicker. Hmm. Right? And all they're doing, they're, in other words, they are more bonded. You know, they're, they're more bonded. They trust each other. They're bonded uh, better than the other group. One of the other unfortunate aspects of this is that the groups, um, they instantly think that they're better than the other group. <laughs> These people have that, you know, they've not met before most of them. They're just randomly divided into two groups. And it becomes us against them. But the group that has done synchronous movement they trust each other more. Mm. So we're talking a group. We're talking uh, music. We're talking singing, uh, making music, triggering all those neurotransmitters. Right? And we're talking about synchronous movement, you know, synchronous movement, enhancing bonding. Then touch. Right? And touch, we now know, is much more powerful than we ever uh, imagined. <laughs> When, when you have wanted touch, um, let's say for a moment, one of my close buddies comes in here and he just puts his hand on my shoulder. So he just puts his hand on my shoulder. I'm going to get a hit of endorphins and oxytocin. My frontal lobes are going to relax a little bit. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful experiment, experience. And we're, we're not aware of it. Just that little touch on my shoulder is going to trigger that. One of the most uh, interesting experiments was actually done by a researcher here at University of Virginia, Jim Cohn. And he puts a, a woman in a scanning machine. So she's in a scanning machine. She gets shown a threat scenario. The part of her brain, the fear part of her brain, the amygdala, <laughs> lights up. Mm -hmm. okay. <clears throat> Next, uh, she's in a scanning machine, and she's holding the hand of a stranger, somebody she's not met. She's just holding the hand of the stranger. Shown a threat scenario. Her amygdala lights up, but not as much. She's just holding the hand of the stranger. Still lights up, but not as much. Then, third experiment, she is holding the hand of her partner. Shown a threat scenario, amygdala barely lights up. Holding the hand of her partner. Where it's even more interesting is that the degree to which her amygdala does not light up, in other words, the calmer she is in the face of threat, the calmer she is, tracks with her rating of the quality of her relationship with her partner. So if she rates it as a very good relationship, it lights up the least. You know, very powerful evidence that touch uh, impacts our brain, impacts our bonding, impacts how we respond to threat even. Right? And again, it's probably endorphins, oxytocin. So what is song and dance? Song is making music, endorphins, dopamine, serotonin, um, Dance, physical movement, again, um, endorphins, oxytocin, particularly with physical movement, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, right? And touch, endorphins, oxytocin. 
I do, I do want to stop here for a second just to say my mom, my mom had to have some work, uh, work done on her. So she had to go to the hospital and they, they gave her some medication she wasn't allowed to eat on. And she was really scared going in. And she told me this about a month ago. I didn't even realize this till he mentioned it on the episode. Um, she told me like a month ago that the just one of the ladies in there, she's just like, can you please hold my hand as they were putting her to sleep? Because she was terrified. And she just held someone's hand and it made her feel better. So it's weird that um, that got brought up. I really uh, think this is a really interesting approach to describing the natural phenomenon and explaining why religion works and we get together. But as he continues, you'll see. Abel Chavez, we come from a pig and a monkey, Quran, thus faces and variety, but come with intelligence, Torah, higher or lower than the animals at times depends. I, Abel, what, what, what can I say? Like, honestly, what can I say? I don't believe that for a second. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know what to say, Abel. Abel says, put Bible and Quran together, superimposed, paralleled. I appreciate the super chats and getting your voice out there, but uh, totally disagree, man. I, I don't know what else to say. Uh, thanks for the support. Mirror neurons. <clears throat> okay. Mirror neurons uh, work this way. So you're sitting there watching me right now. I'm going to raise my right hand. I raise my right hand, an area on my left motor strip lights up, lights up. Mm -hmm. You're watching this, okay? You're not raising your right hand, but watching this, the same area in your brain lights up. Other parts of your frontal lobe are suppressing it, but the area that would light up if you lifted your right hand, okay, it's going to light up. People who have frontal lobe damage, if I lift my hand, even if they don't want to, they'll lift theirs. Right? Wow. These are mirror neurons. So. Um, I see somebody who's in pain. Um, um, I've got, uh, uh, I see somebody who's got a cut on their hand, right? And, and so uh, they've got a cut there on their left hand. Um, this, the sensory area for my left hand lights up as well. We literally feel each other's pain. We have to learn to desensitize ourselves not to. Right? But mirror neurons are very powerful. So you can feel like, you know, I don't want any part of that ritual but it is still going to, is still going to impact you. You know, you might you know, stand there with your arms crossed, you know, watching some religious ritual, but it's still getting to you. Um, you know, you see a wave in a stadium, right? You don't want to participate, but it's still impacting uh, you <laughs> if you were doing the wave. Now, this is one of my favorite illustrations. Now, for those of you who remember, in 2012, um, former President Clinton gave the nominating speech for then President Obama. And Clinton finishes his speech. And then, to the surprise of the audience, uh, President Obama walks out. Uh, Clinton uh, sort of bows, an act of submission, sort of bows. And then the two men embrace. And Obama is rubbing Clinton's back like crazy. And you can see a tear in Bill Clinton's eye. Very powerful moment. What most people in the audience don't know is that these two men hated each other. There's an article in the New Yorker magazine that details it. These two men absolutely hated each other. Um, and, and there was, you know, because Obama had beaten uh, Hillary Clinton in 2008 in the primaries, but they hated each other. And it was like the Middle East peace accords getting these two men back together. Hmm. And Clinton agreed to do the talk, the nominating speech. And it was a powerful speech, wonderful speech. And then the two men embrace. These are two men who absolutely hated each other. Right? <clears throat> and what you see, you see Obama, you know, stroking his back. There's, there's hugging, there's touching, there's powerful endorphin and oxytocin release at this moment. If you remember it, if you happen to see it, which I did, you could not, you could not, not be moved. Even if you didn't like either man, it was a very powerful moment. I found myself welling up, right? That's mirror neurons. You know, I'm not on the stage of the Democratic Convention. I'm nowhere near it, right? I'm not involved. I'm just watching it, and it, it's it's very powerful. So those are mirror neurons, right? So we have we have uh, song, dance, uh, physical movement, symmetrical movement, mirror neurons. Why is this important? Because these are the things that go into uh, religious ritual. 
right? What do these rituals do? Remember, we have very important um, close group living. Imagine if you were living in a small hunter-gatherer group of 100 people in uh, harsh environments, and you have got to be, you've got to get along with everybody. Well, they're going to be freeloaders. You've got to find out who those people are. Um, rituals may expose them. Um, they're rituals of punishment. You do have to punish offenders, but you're still mutually interdependent. You want to keep them in the group. You want to punish them, but keep them in the group. Uh, rituals are a way of, of commitment, signaling commitment to the group. If you're not doing the ritual, you're signaling that you're not committed to the group. So you do the ritual, and whether you like it or not, you know you you get those same uh, chemicals. Uh, courtship, you know, there's a lot of you know you saw in that kung san the women. Are Pausing for a second here and might as well say it. Mark, to all of you, especially the host to this show, I challenge you. There's no proof you can give that there's no creator. All of what you've got going to give here has already been told before. And I used to like you. How do I win your heart back? How can I win your love and favor? What, what creed can I say? Is there a particular religion that I can just say is true and then you'll like me again? What will it take, Mark? What will it take? Um, no, you can't. Like, I don't know how I would be able to disprove a negative. And I'm not the one saying that there is a creator. Uh, if anything, you might say divine hiddenness. I don't know, whatever explanations you might have for why God doesn't just show up and prove himself or herself or itself. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know why you don't like me. What did I do to you? How did I hurt your feelings? Anyway, back to the show. Hallelujah. Oh, I messed up. The guy who said not to say hallelujah. I triggered him. Oh man. I triggered him. They're in the center and they're checking out the guys, you know, who's committed to the group. Um, it is also courtship involved, even in religious rituals. Um, you have to ease communal conflict. Um, uh, we come together for rituals uh, when we want to defend territory. Um, rituals are a way of signaling uh, our quality and identity of a group, um, and it has to prepare men for war. Think of all the rituals. Think of the rituals that the football teams went through before uh, the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many of you saw the opening ceremonies at um, the Beijing Olympics in 2008. Um, those were downright frightening, I thought. I mean, the Chinese were signaling that, you know, we are, we're in the modern world now and we are serious. Go back and look at the 2008 opening, uh, opening ceremonies at the, at the Olympics. Unbelievable. So uh, religious rituals and group or group rituals, they enhance bonding and they do all these other things. And they do it with the, the neurotransmitters. Now, uh, one of my favorites here is you, you remember that um, the Pentecostals. Um, Anybody know why pews were put in Christian churches in the 14th century? I have no idea. Right? It's because um, the political leadership is trying to take over religion, right? And pews were put in Christian churches originally to stop the dancing. Hmm. You know, trying to control the group a little bit more. They, they literally look up the origin of those uncomfortable pews that we sat on for all those years. <laughs> You know, I was a, brought up in the Presbyterian Church, God's frozen people, um, <laughs> um, and, and all those hard pews. pews were originally put in Christian churches, I think, in the 14th century to stop the dancing. What did people do? They just moved the dancing to Saturday night, you know, carnival. Uh, <laughs> but this is, this is a religious, this is what goes into religious ritual. And you see this in the Kung San, the Andaman Islanders, and the Aborigines. It's a window into deep time. It's a window into those original uh, rituals. Imagine doing those kind of rituals eight or 12 hours, right? It, it's, it's huge. Um, um, and, uh, you know, again, ancient cave paintings, the, the, the ancient cave paintings are always of people together. You don't see, you know, one person, you know, sitting down with a cup of coffee. Um, now, uh, let me encourage you to try this. If you're even with just one other person while you're watching this, uh, just hit the pause button and, um, um, let me give you a little experiment that you can do at home. And this is an experiment I do with audiences when I have the audience in front of me for the talk. What I want you to do is three things to start with. First of all, I want you to just think about how you're feeling. Just what's your mood? How are you feeling today? Just you know, take a mind's eye of that. Number one. 
Number two, think of somebody you care about. It's somebody where there's a pretty bad conflict right now between you and this person that you care about. And just think about how right now you feel about that person. Okay. okay. The third thing I'd like you to do is to take the back of your hand, the, the skin on the back of your hand, and just pinch it as hard as you can. Try to create as much pain as you can. Just you know, really crunch down on it, right? Just you know, really get a sense of where that pain is. Do those three things. Now, if you've got somebody there with you, you know, hopefully maybe a couple people there with you, but it's the pandemic, just even if it's one person, I'd like you to stand up, right? Stand up and put your arm around the person. Everybody's got their arm around each other, right? So uh, I'm gonna imagine that Derek is right here, right? So Derek is right next to me. We've got our arms around each other, right? And, and we're gonna start swaying. You know, just swaying symmetrically, rhythmically. We're gonna get a good sway going. Right? Get a good sway going here, right? Then I want you to sing out loud as loud as you can. You know, a couple verses of happy birthday. If it's not your birthday, maybe happy birthday to Charles Garland. But just belt out a couple of verses of happy <laughs> birthday, right? So what are we doing? We're doing symmetrical movement. We're doing touch, right? Okay. Um, and then we're making music, right? Um, uh, symmetrical movement, touch, making music, stimulating all those neurotransmitters. I feel like I'm spending way too much time dealing with other people's problems. Oh, it was just getting good. Why would you do that to me? So maybe do just a couple verses of happy birthday, right? And you do that. And, and I appreciate I'm making you self-conscious, but I'd encourage you, try to do this ritual. Okay, try to just, just do this. Trust me. Then what I want you to do, after you've done it, and your self-consciousness has quieted down for a minute, then pinch your skin. See if you can make it hurt as much. My prediction is you can't. No matter how hard you try, it's not going to hurt as much. Because you boosted those in right? Then I want you to think about that person that you're in conflict with and how you feel about it. And again, my prediction would be that it, it, it'll be harder to generate the same level of frustration or anger you might be feeling towards that person at the moment. Then the third thing we're doing in reverse order would be to you know, just think about how you're feeling. If you notice any change in your emotional state. And again, my prediction would be if you can get away from the self-consciousness of having done it, that you'll notice that you're, you're just feeling a little bit better, a little bit more energetic, feeling, you just feel better, right? Okay. Those are the fundamental elements of religious ritual. Mm. Imagine, imagine doing that in the savannas of Africa or the outback of Australia for eight, 12 hours, like these, like these people do, right? Think of that intent. I mean, it would be impossible, no matter you know, how you're feeling about the group, it would be impossible not to have triggered massive outpourings of those neurotransmitters and hormones and have the changes that um, I've described. Now, let me tell you something that I sometimes do, is that I will put slides together that have all the verses of Amazing Grace. And I'll have an audience you know, do the swaying, right? And um, um, do the touching. And then I will ask them to sing. And these are audiences of atheists, okay? These are <laughs> audiences of atheists, right? And I will ask them to sing something, Amazing Grace, the content of which goes against their beliefs. Right? Absolutely goes against their beliefs. Right? And I'll have them sing four verses of Amazing Grace. And even though it's against their beliefs, most of the people you know, get the same boost that um, I've described. Um, it's, it's posted on the internet, but I did a talk in Israel specifically on uh, ritual. And I had one of the rabbis there uh, who invited me to have everybody sing a, a particular song. And you, you can see the audience doing this. And you can also see that there are people in the audience who feel too self-conscious to do it. And, um, and, and they're getting, the, because of mirror neurons and the fact that they're surrounded by all their friends doing this, they're getting that same tip. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was a fascinating experience. It was one of the, the, the most interesting uh, uh, trips and, and meetings I've ever been to, because this was at a, at a religious school. Uh, the people there were uh, largely um, uh, religious. Uh, and in fact, the person who invited me was a rabbi and to talk about a, a ritual. Right now, <clears throat> um, 
this is a place in um, eastern Turkey that's important. If you, if you look it up, Gobekli Tepe. Um, why am I showing this? Here's the reason. The standard view used to be that we were hunter-gatherers, then we settled into agricultural communities, then we developed religion. And that used to be the traditional view, or you know, a group religion, a, a, a widespread group religion. That, that was the standard view. Gobekli Tepe demonstrates that while we were still hunter-gatherers, we came to this area where we built some uh, stone monuments and we held religious rituals and religious feasts while we were still hunter-gatherers. And so it has flipped things around. Right? So people, while still you know, in you know, Paleolithic, Neolithic times, uh, still living as hunter-gatherers, would come together for these uh, religious uh, rituals. What's uh, interesting is that they also took wild barley and brewed beer. Right? And uh, this is some of the evidence of it, that they took wild barley and brewed beer. Now, why? Okay, Because one of the reasons that we drink alcohol is that when we drink alcohol, the neurotransmitter that gets triggered, endorphins, bonding. Alcohol hits these mu opioid receptors in our brain. They're involved with endorphins that create bonding. So it, it, it reduces suspicion, reduces anxiety. Think about when you drink, you feel closer to other people, you open up, there's greater bonding. So um, when we moved from hunter-gatherers to more settled uh, communities, um, you know, we used religion to bring groups together to bond them. And it was probably song, you know, dance, touch, rhythmic movement, and alcohol. And they think one of the reasons we may have settled down into agricultural communities is to brew better beer. The original bread was not for eating, it was to hold the barley used for beer. So your Southern Baptist friends who won't dance and won't drink, you can tell them they're being anti-religious. <laughs> um, um, right? They're going against the grain. I just thought about something you know, all my experiences with my Baptist friends that don't get tipsy, no wonder they were very dry and not very exciting. <laughs> it, it, it was just uh, very like by the book, you know, you need a longer skirt and don't drink and this and that. Anyway, um, this is really interesting, the way that he's approaching all these different social phenomena. And, and for somebody who's not looking at this from the beginning, I could see why this would make no dent in terms of what you're thinking about why we believe in gods. Uh, but if we can explain all that, like I said, natural phenomena, I can explain it. Why do we need the conclusion? Why do we need to make the assumption that there is a God? Anyway, let's keep going. Um, and, and this is one of the stones from Gobekli Tepe, and you can see the figures touching and dancing. Next time you see this, I want you to see it differently. Um, these are obviously Islamic men gathering for prayer. Right? And I want you to see this a little bit differently because I hope, if I've done my work well this morning, you can see that this has all the elements of ancient religion, of our original religion. These men are moving symmetrically. This is a dance, right? They're moving physical activity. Hey, uh, real quick, um, you know, I, I see comments that come all the time and I always like, what in the world? Lack of education, nothing more. I don't know what you're referring to, but I see these like little drop tidbits that come from some of the people who chat. And it's like, you're talking to a PhD in this particular field, but they're lacking the education. Another thing, Mark, Derek, please ask questions if you're unlearned to certain topics. I do. That's why I interview experts. Because I don't know. But the real question, and I wish people practiced this more, Mark, is I wish the audiences that didn't know the answers would ask questions. But you can't when you think you have the truth, when you think you have all the answers. And these other experts in the field who've studied this material don't. And it looks not only like like ego, like uh, uh, we're right and you're wrong and you don't even know the, the field. You haven't really studied this stuff, it seems. Um, there's something about that. What is this? Um, real quick here. 
I am looking up an image here because I want to show something, some image. I think this is important to show. And I notice this a lot in faith communities and people who like get biblical and stuff or different, different religious religions and stuff like that. The Dunning Kruger effect. Okay. The reason why I think this is a big deal is when you're really not educated on something or you don't really know much, there's this, like, you seem like you know everything. This is something that I, a lot of people do is like they're, they're aware, they know. And then there's this moment where you actually start learning stuff and you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. And then your confidence level of what you're learning actually goes down the more you actually learn and you're open to having conversation and learning these things and having the questions and answers and whatnot go back and forth. But like, I noticed this happens a lot in the communities where it's like, we need to learn from you. You like nobody in the faith communities that are asking these things or saying these things in my chat are really interested in learning from us. They want you to learn from them. You need to learn from me about how the shroud of turn is truly the shroud. And it's like, I'm talking to a historian who knows the entire literature and has studied the dating and the carbon dating of it, knowing when the forgeries of these shrouds came up, et cetera, et cetera. But you know better than the experts in the field that are talking about the subject. It's kind of weird to me. Anyway, I just, you know, just saying. And he don't understand our book. This, this, uh, what is your book, Mark? What is your book? What is your book? I'm waiting for Mark to answer that before we continue. Daniel says, myth vision, the weirdest part is most of those snarky questions could be answered with 10 minutes of reading. That is true. I am looking. Mark, what's your book? Why don't you believe in God? My book is the Bible. So yeah, Thompson's not a biblical scholar, but you've literally come to a place where this is exactly what we do. We talk about the Bible. We have academics on and we, we literally discuss this. Experts who read and know the languages and know the surrounding context um, also know where a lot of the myths that the Bible's getting their stories from come from. So I don't, I don't get it. I mean, what do you do? What do you do? I don't know. Help me out, chat. L, Derek is salty because he doesn't understand life. <laughs> uh, polymathing, nice shirt, Derek. Thank you. Thank you. Derek is fake. Derek is fake. <laughs> God is real. <laughs> Man, you got shit backwards, dude. Um, Derek has a whole bunch of nerds on. Yes, yes, we do. Yes, you do. Um, I, I'm wasting time. We're getting sidetracked here because we're getting <laughs> this. You, you guys make me laugh, okay? Ah, uh, you make me laugh. Oh, Flamio, thank you. Yes, we do. We nerd out here, biblically speaking. But <laughs> what, do you, what do you do? Oh, man, you guys are hilarious. What are we going through now, Derek? Is a religious... What we're going through now, Derek, with Derek is a religious experience. Are you guys feeling the spirit right now? I'm feeling it. It's like there's a bonding moment here of true metaphysical divineness happening right now. Do you feel that? Sway with me, will you? Everybody in the chat, just sway with me. <laughs> oh, you guys are funny. Jack, is it Jacquez? I always butcher your name. Thank you for the super chat. Or, uh, or sorry, the compliment. We love you, Derek, and are here to make you happy. <laughs> Listen, I swear on everything. Even the critical like jabs make me laugh. They make me, they make me laugh. So. I, I always enjoy a little bit of entertainment in the chat, as long as people are being like decent, you know, you can't be overboard, but if you think I'm an idiot, just say that you think I'm an idiot. Okay. Just tell me what you really think. Um, I kind of think it's funny, honestly, like I don't, 
I don't get offended by it. Constellation Pegasus, screw religion, physics is everything. The universe is going to be going to do regardless of what you think and feel about it. Too sad many can't comprehend this. I mean, like this is true. The universe is something much bigger than we are. I don't know. Someone's trying to put that love chat, adult dating sites in the comments. Why does that stuff come up? What the heck? I don't, I don't even know why. I always notice that like there's comments under the videos and all my friends' YouTube channels too. Like, why is that the case? Let me go in here. I'm going to put the chat on slow mode because I think it helps us reduce that from being a problem. So bear with me for one second. I am going to it now. Okay, we're live. Customization. Slow mode. We'll put it on Derek mode, which is slow mode. <laughs> okay, we put on slow mode. Okay, uh, we are back. Timmy B, I'm going in October. Because we were heathen. Did, you, did everybody feel the Holy Spirit for a moment there? Scott, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate it. I feel like I'm finally having someone who says I'm right. My wife says I'm wrong all the time. So what can you do? What can you do? I seriously appreciate it. Have experts on. Thanks for everything you do. Yes, we do. We do try to have experts on. But, but, um, you know, some people don't care about experts. They really don't. So let's get back to uh, why we believe in gods with Dr. Andy Thompson. They're moving symmetrically, right? Okay, they're, they're huddled together. There's touch. And I don't know if you've ever heard the Muslim chants. They're actually quite beautiful, regardless of what you think of Islam. They're beautiful, right? It's a closed space. This is a dance. Now, it's a dance with all the elements, all the echoes of the original religion. Song, dance, trance, all there, right? Um, we think of Buddhists as, you know, in red monks, uh, in red guard uh, sitting. This is a Buddhist ceremony. And again, it is making music. It's a song. It is dance. It's symmetrical movement. And just watching it, you'll feel it. Um, think of the Wailing Wall. In Jerusalem, the men standing by the wailing wall, they're moving symmetrically. It's a dance. They're crowded together. They're um, touching. Uh, it's symmetrical movement. Um, and they are reciting out loud. They're making music. Again, you see, I hope, all the elements of uh, the original uh, religion. And, of course, uh, you know, Christian churches. Um, the singing and, uh, and obviously, um, as much as the pews have tried to inhibit dancing, you know, uh, particularly a lot of African American churches. I mean, you you, you see the dancing, um, oh, yeah. but you see again. I hope all the echoes, all the remnants of the original religion of human beings, of Homo sapiens, and um, all the mechanisms that are used to trigger these neurotransmitters and neurohormones that create an intense emotional experience and intense bonding. That brings me to uh, the conclusion, and uh, I love this uh, cartoon, and it says. Uh, I wish you would make up your mind, Mr. Dickens. Uh, was it the best of times or was it the worst of times? Um, it could scarcely have been both. And that was, of course, uh, you know, Dickens' famous uh, line. Um, it's the best of times. It's the worst of times. And what I want to end with is this, that I think um, Mr. Dickens was right, um, that it is um, the worst of times, yet it is also the best of times. It's the worst of times in that all you have to do is turn on a television. All you have to do is pick up a newspaper and you can see how uh, religion still poisons so much of life on earth. And it, it really, I think, constitutes one of the main barriers to a global civil society. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just I think there's no way if you're an honest observer of human life, if you suddenly arrive from Mars, you would notice these religions. Um, the religious differences, the religious warfare. And I think it doesn't take much to conclude that one of the still terrible barriers to a global civil society is um, religion. As Christopher Hitchens said, it poisons everything. Yet, 
if I've done my work well this morning, I hope I have shown you it is also the best of times. Why do I say that? It is the best of times because we, we are the first generation in the history of the world. We are the first generation that now understands how and why human minds generate religious beliefs, where they come from, their structure, their power, you know, why they, why they hold such a, a, a grip on us. We now are really getting close to a comprehensive psychological science of religious belief. And so um, that's why I think it's also the best of times. Mm. And so I think it leaves us with basically three questions. What am I going to do with this knowledge? Number one. Number two, what are you going to do with this knowledge that is now out there? But most importantly, what are we as democratic, scientifically literate societies going to do with this knowledge for future generations? Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you. That was, <laughs> that was highly educational. And obviously, it brings up so many points. Also, 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 go ahead then. So, all right, what did you guys think about that presentation? I'm here for you in the chat. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, this was a presentation he did a little different than the original one that I saw, but explaining how just one little step beyond what we already experience naturally is how we come up with religion, how we come up with gods, how we posit these ideas. And if you go back to pre-literate societies, when there were oral traditions, they connected dots in ways where there weren't really any connections. They were like obscure, distant connections. For example, every spring we see green come to life, right? We see all the green and fertility on earth. And they observed the stars because that's how they knew when to plant and crop, etc. But they saw the star Venus. I use this analogy often for those who watch me. They see the star Venus rise and they go, that star has the power of life. Now you go, well, today we don't see Venus itself bringing fertility to Earth. We don't see the connection. But they saw it because every time spring came, there was something to do with Venus that would come up on the horizon and whatnot. And the point I'm getting at is like they're connecting dots because they're pattern-seeking creatures. We all are. And this is how we ended up drawing to the conclusions. What do you think? What do you think? Got a super chat here. Josiah... You are getting true salvation, my friend. Thank you for the super chat. Wow, tough crowd today. Keep your chin up, Derek. Love what you do, and I'm enjoying this topic. Josiah, thank you so much, man. Really do appreciate the positivity. From time to time, I need that. You know, I got to get a little pat on the back for the work that I do. But um, but yeah, 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 I'm, I'm having fun. Like, it's really not a, they're not that tough, Josiah. They're not that tough, you know. I'm tougher than that. No, seriously, though, uh, appreciate the support, supporting the channel and the positive words. It really does mean a lot to me to know that people are enjoying this stuff. And I also think that anyone who sits around in my chats 24-7, like every time I do a live, there are repeat names who watch and they don't agree. They probably don't agree with any videos that I ever do, but they're in my chat. And that should show that we welcome them. Uh, I don't know if it's because they want to convince everybody to think like them and that's their entire purpose. I don't know. But uh, I try to think that maybe we give an environment that is welcoming to people with differing ideas. We can disagree. That's fine. But uh, I like to think that. Tell me if I'm on to something with that chat because you're the ones who watch me. And you know, sometimes it's the observers who aren't you that can tell and see like, what is it that attracts you? What is it that draws you to myth vision? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Daniel Whitaker says, I still think we're all born atheist and everything we know about any gods come from another person. I agree with that. Not instinct. Interesting vid and talk though. Um, so this is the tough part. This is the tough part. I agree with you, but I also think that the belief in these gods and things is like, it's right there with the natural tendencies we have. It's like that one little step. So 
while I know that no specific gods, except for those who've been indoctrinated to believe in him or a specific tradition, um, has been like taught to the newborn child, it takes time in teaching the child the tradition or the god or the idea. The all of the mechanisms for why we believe in these things, we are automatically kind of prone to do that. It's difficult to be like extremely scientific method critical unless you're being taught to be that. Like it, most people are just passing down the traditions they've learned. And I think the same way we naturally are looking, we, we cry to our mothers for food. We like all of the instinctual things that we do have where you say not instinct. I think those tendencies are being utilized in this particular area. So maybe we, maybe there's somewhere in the middle here, Daniel, that we can meet and say, hey, I don't know though. It doesn't matter to me if we were born assuming there was something beyond us or not because we were literally birthed in something beyond us, a womb. We assume parents beyond us. And when they're not around, we cry as if they are around, hoping that they will come to our rescue and help feed us and things. So it's like one little step further and you have this idea, the imagination is kicking in and hoping something more and greater is there. My thoughts, uh, there's probably a lot more to it than what I just said, but just throwing it out there. And thank you for the support. I do appreciate the support. Evangelical humanist, good presentation. Good to draw in different perspectives, fields of inquiry. Also want to send you some dopamine <laughs> for an important stream yesterday on Rushdie. Kudos for keeping communication open. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Yeah, that was a, a hot topic because it is a serious situation right now. And um, yeah, Poste Prophet, man, he really, he really got heated yesterday. And I mean, he gets death threats a lot from those who are religious um, devotees of Islam. And I just was reading comments this morning that were just kind of discouraging that were praising and encouraging and calling this 24 year old guy who stabbed Rushdie a hero and stuff. And I was just like, Oh my gosh. Like he was a hero of Islam and, and Allah's, you know, all this stuff. And I was just like, man, that sucks. You know, that we have that kind of stuff going on, but we have a lot of problems in the world. Um, I'm just pointing out one of them. I really appreciate that though. Thank you. I keep bringing them. I'm going to keep bringing them. Thanks for the support. Constellation Pegasus. Again, I'm still waiting for some apologists to show what happened to the universe that caused it to be defective from the Bible. It's a potential death sentence. Hopefully we can leave it one day. Mm. Yeah, it depends on which apologist you talk to. Cause some of them think that when they're like extreme fundamentalists, they think death didn't enter the world until the fall. So I guess some of them might even try to say that cannibalism didn't exist and the bones and death that we see before six, 7,000 years ago. Well, that was planted there by Satan. Dinosaur bones were planted there by Satan. What level of apologist are we talking about? Then you have other apologists who remind me of the philosophers back in the day, the Greeks who found ways to not show the, the, the bad outdated things and they find ways to reconcile the bible with modern science and they're very advanced in modern science they understand it they agree with it they probably go so so far to agree with um you know everything when it comes to the origin of life and they just think god's working somehow in the scene of evolution like they have but, but they're biblicists they believe the bible's true and what that means isn't literally true there might be some other meaning to them. And yeah, anyway, Constellation, I think that we'll look back, fingers crossed, the same way we look at the Greek myths, I hope we look back at all of these myths and all of the narratives and all the stories and see that these were part of our past. They were part of our story as humans. And maybe we can look at them and understand more about how we thought back then and where we are today. And I'm saying in a thousand years, if we're still around, hopefully we look at it and go, wow, we've learned so much about human anatomy, uh, anthropology, all of the fields of science, understanding the humans, the human race and everything there is to it, to where we look back and go, wow, we were thinking this way. 
maybe this scientific inquiry that we're doing today on this episode is showing that. Maybe. All right, let's see. Ah, Mark, Mark, Mark. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been there. Been there, man. Um, caught up on that. Did you guys like this presentation? How was it fun? Was it cool? I figured I'd give people something different to think about. Don't know if you guys have, you know, heard anything like this. Some of you seem like you're like Derek. You need to read this because you haven't heard anything like, okay, I've, I've got some learning to do for sure. But uh, I hope you enjoyed that. I really do. Now, let me know what you think before I go. I need to hear what everybody has to say. Drop a like while you're at it, if you would. Be so kind to help the algorithm gods pay attention to the true gods of myth vision. Please, pretty please. The godless are more easily able to see God for what it is. I agree. Um, it was great. I like the scientific approach to belief. They think we come from, what is this? Is that a turkey or something? Nice change of pace. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. I did something different today. Coolest session. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Mark, uh, Mark says, why don't you invite Hebrew Israelite and to use the atheistic theory? What is that? To disprove all of their lies. Aren't you a Hebrew Israelite? You said you were one. So, and then what do you mean by the atheist theory? The atheist theory, I don't understand. I hope to see more like this. Yeah, me too. I hope to do more like this. Uh, Teresa said, love this, or I loved this. Absolutely. I really, really appreciate it. Joshua says, 98% in common with pigs, but people love to focus on chimps. Yeah, because we look exactly like pigs. We have hoofs and all of that too. Uh, I don't know what you mean by in common because there are specific details. If you're talking about genetics, if you're talking about DNA, if you're talking about there are differences in different ways. But I'm not the expert. I would talk to Guts at Gibbon, who debated a creationist on this recently, who tried to talk about how we have so much in common with turtles, you know? And then, but they wanted to try and act like that commonality that we were closer to turtles than we were to chimpanzees, and that's not the case. Uh, Lauren Jones, great topic, Derek. Thank you, Lauren. I think you are uh, down under in Australia, and you're just now catching this in the morning. So I hope you're enjoying your morning. Courtney says, new to your channel, enjoying your fascinating subject matter. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Shereen says, fascinating, unraveling our bodily internal hormones, ruling how we interact with the world and view reality. Wow. I really enjoy that. Pseudo Derek, I'd love to chat with you sometime. Email me. Another way to easily is join the Patreon. As little as $3 a month, you can message me and I will make sure that I message you back. Um... Alan Bird says, you need to have Professor Robin Dunbar on and discuss his new book, How Religion Evolved. Okay. Message me, Alan. You know you're one of the patrons. So message me on Patreon. And I am moving. Let me give a fair warning. We are selling this house we're at now. We just now are listing it today. I have been working, trying to run Myth Vision and trying to get this house right. We got the house right today, and uh, we're going to list it. And I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that we can get this thing sold and I can get to my new location with my kids. I haven't seen them in months now. So I miss my three babies, my boys. And um, I can't wait to hit the ground running. So when I get there, Alan, I'll be emailing like crazy all of these scholars and I'd love to learn more from them. And of course, I'll have time to read as well. I haven't been able to do that as hard as I've been working. You should do a, compl uh, a show completely on the origins of music. That was interesting. I wish your guests would have personally demonstrated ritualistic dancing and singing. <laughs> right, Pat? Uh, let's see. How would how would that look, you know? Good morning. We are all apes, Dan says. I agree. I agree. Yeah, uh, please do. It's it's only $3, literally a month. You can get the whole year at 16% off. So I think it's like 32 bucks or something. I can't remember the exact amount, but the whole year and every video I drop, Anything I do, you have early access, all of that. You can talk to me personally for like 32 bucks the whole year. 
And I'm constantly dropping new content. Now, just the past week and a half, two weeks, it's not been as constant because of my moving. But when I get where I'm going, people on Patreon, it's just going to be overwhelming. Like, what in the world is going on here? But uh, yeah. Joka Latte. Man, Derek, keep up the good work. The people you bring just help to see things from a different perspective and more logical. Thank you. I agree. Absolutely. And that's what impressed me as someone who came from magical thinking, like that, that assuming something that I don't have any data to actually believe, but I had the faith in, and I believe it, uh, just that little leap, right? That leap in thinking to what I'm doing now, looking at science and trying to understand in the natural world, it it's impressive. And I feel more like I'm in my skin. I know what I am as a human. Um, I'm not this like fallen angel, fallen creature that God had once made good and it fell and I'm in this bad state of death and stuff and all the ideology that comes with that. Like I'm just, just another animal on earth trying to make it and trying to understand the world around me. It's really peaceful to know that and not think all of that the uh, worldviews that I once held are true. So thank you. I appreciate the super chat. Constellation Pegasus, try to interview Leonard Suskind one day. He got me back into physics watching his speeches. He is awesome. Okay. I don't know who they are, but every person that you have listed in this interview, email them to me, please. Because when I get where I'm going, it's on like Donkey Kong. I'm going to make it happen. Waiting until you are settled in your new home, Alan. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. You could message me now, and if I don't respond right now, you you know understand that I will get to it. I promise. I promise. Oh, Pocket Laga, love you, bro. Starting this from the beginning because I showed up late. Please don't extend my stay in purgatory. I get bored easily. Look, e Jay, you're going to be in purgatory. I wish I was able to just snap my fingers, but... I'll give you some entertainment while you're in purgatory. Watch the live stream. By the end, you'll have an apotheosis and become one of the divine. Great apes. Shy. Three boys. Well done. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. I really appreciate that. Um, Dan, Dan Smith, godless and soulless. I've asked you a question. Read again, godless. I don't know if that's to me. We are ape vision. <laughs> I don't take that as a, as, a, as a slap in the face. Some great apes lost their adjective. Please, can you invite Hebrew Israelite scholar on the show? The show was good. Okay. What? What? I don't understand. Hebrew Israelite, what's... I don't understand what that has to do with... Uh, you talking about for this show or you mean like in the future? Like to do an episode with, an, with a Hebrew Israelite? I'm trying to understand what you're trying to say. Apes together strong. We need science included when it covers evolution, consciousness, cosmology, ex-religious. Ex-religious often know so little, though no fault of their own. Mm, good point. Good point. Going through your chat here. Suda, you're awesome. Now you're God. I didn't want to tell you that. <laughs> I would have scared you maybe, but... You know, you just created a whole new universe by joining the Patreon. I hope you feel, do you feel that? You feel that, don't you? You feel it. I feel it. Come on. You know, you feel it. Pseudo, you're a God. You feel it. We love you, Derek. You are one awesome human being, brother. Cheers. Thank you, SS1964. I really appreciate that. Um... What's to say? Bing bong <laughs> on point, my guy. <laughs> I was thinking about a bong when I seen, saw bing bong. I was thinking a bong. Hmm. Seriously appreciate that. Uh, I'm not sure what it, what James, did I miss something you said about Toby? I don't know. Scrolling down. I said, keep punching until you get tired of it. I mean, I haven't been working out. I used to. Uh, I just, yeah. You felt it. Okay. You felt it. You felt it. it. You felt it. it, 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 it. Yeah, I knew it. That laugh isn't like sarcasm, everybody. 
that laugh is the laughing of the Holy Spirit of myth vision. So he says like the giggles, you know, they come when you get the Holy Spirit of myth vision and become divine. <laughs> I really, really, I know you can't help that you're laughing right now because it's that powerful. It'll, it'll, you know, it'll, you'll be on your throne before long. You won't feel that uh, excitement the same way. You'll just get comfortable being where you are. This show is good. Can you next time bring Hebrew Israelite scholar? What the heck, Dan? Dan, what the heck does that have to do with this show? <laughs> what the heck is this? Yes, invite Hebrew, uh, Hebrew Israelite to hear from that perspective on what they think, whether in the future or now. Or now. Well, this show has nothing to do with that right now. So um, maybe I'll do a future debate. We'll have a future debate on myth vision. How about that? I'll get someone who understands the Hebrew Israelite particular tradition and that they aren't one. And then I'll have a Hebrew Israelite come on and they can debate over their particular faith. That's something I'll do. But as far as like, what am I? It's literally a religious worldview, a, a particular religious practice and a group of people that are actually, you know, going to be trying to sell you on their God being the true God. And uh, depending on what kind of Hebrew Israelite community you were part of, but um, I definitely would love to put a de debate together. I already have the right person in mind that I'd like to have debate it on my channel. Evangelical humanists, hope you have a good move to the be to the best coast. <laughs> you must live out there. I will. I will have a safe uh, trip, and I plan on making that happen soon. We. I want to be out of here in the next week and be in my new home with my babies. Uh, I miss them. I really do. For those who watched this episode and you enjoyed it, this is the book that I based it on. Uh, let me hide your super chat. Thank you so much for that. This is the book. Let me zoom in uh, on the cover. Why We Believe in Gods, A Concise Guide to the Science of Faith. There are other books like this and that cover completely different topics but are science-based that are going to explain what's going on, why we believe in these things. Um, I hope that you go on my recommended book list that I have in every description and it's recommended. The item was already there. So if you go and you type in why we believe in gods or click the link in the description, get you a copy. It's not a long read. You can get it on audible as well. So if you're driving in the car, you want to listen, there's a lot he did not go over in the presentation that is in the book. Highly recommend it. Here's the Patreon. For those who want to become one of the gods, just join the Patreon. I mean, you literally become a god. Who wouldn't want to do that? So hundreds of videos. If you keep scrolling down like this and you hit load more at the bottom of the screen, you will keep finding nuggets deep in the earth of the Patreon. I mean, there's hundreds of videos that have never made, never been made public. Um, and then, uh, what is this last thing here? Oh, Dr. Anderson, Dr. Anderson Thompson's, uh, you or his website. So I don't think I put that in the description, but you just type in J Anderson Thompson and he is a psychologist and you'll be able to find him. Got a super chat here. Somebody's trying to get last minute salvation. I paid more for less Derek, just giving you support now that I've bit. I have a bit more cash. It's belated. I apologize. Listen, I will forgive you. I will forgive you better than the televangelist. Okay? At least you're given to the right televangelist. No, but seriously, thank you for the support. <laughs> uh, in a, into integrational polytheism. Seriously, though, another fascinating show, Derek. All the very best for the move or for your move. Thank you. I really appreciate that love. Appreciate the support. Everybody, go in the description. Join the Patreon. T don't wait. Don't wait. It might be too late. You don't have tomorrow. Do you really want to risk it? Do you really want to risk it? If you're not in Myth Vision's Patreon, <sighs> eternal conscious torment. It's real. It's a thing. And it's bad. Like, think about the weirdest thing that you can think of that you don't like forever and ever. But 
it can all change in just a moment by joining the Patreon. We know you want to do it. I mean, we know you don't want to risk it, right? Constellation Pegasus, again, the Hindus have a, what is this, GOS? Goss, as old as the Jews? Oh, God, sorry, gods. As old as the Jews and still survive to this day. Why doesn't anyone bring the fact up? Th this is true. I think it's because I came out of uh, the Abrahamic faiths, but I will be getting at some point we will get into the myths in Hinduism. We will get into the gods, their stories, their traditions. And I saw a presentation where the gods in Hinduism had a tie-in with Homer's Odyssey, the Iliad, the Odyssey, and whatnot, the Homeric epics. Like there's a connection of a narration, whether they have known of each other or if they know of a common source, this is something I got to get into at some point, Constellation. Thank you. Daniel says, uh, good wishes for your move and enjoy your family reunion. Thank you so much. Can you make a special logo for me, Genie in a Lamp? <laughs> yeah, we will talk, Ghost of Myth Vision. We will talk for sure. Dude, you freaking, how did you know? I didn't want you to bring this up in front of 204 people, Jim Bob. I really wish you didn't put me on the spot right now. Now I'm embarrassed. I'm in a really bad spot here on why I attack Christianity. I can't even say anything. I'm so like, you caught me. And it's true. Christianity is true. I don't know what to say, man. How do I get out of this embarrassment, everybody? I'm not really sure how to do it. And now you even stumped me again. I'm like, you're kicking my ass right now. Sarcasm is the lowest form of wit. You got me again. I'm, look, I'm an idiot. And secretly, I, I know it's true. That's why I do what I do, you know? You know, I had an atheist recently write me on Facebook who actually wrote me saying, in fact, let me pull this up. I think this is worth showing. They said that they're an atheist. And I spoke with apostate prophet, and uh, he told me there are Muslims sometimes who like go into the chats and say, I'm an atheist, but the Muslim had like excellent points and everything that he said made sense. I'm thinking about becoming a Muslim because of this. While that could be the case, I'm not going to rule out that doesn't happen. But most of the time, <laughs> people will say things and you kind of wonder if they're like really not telling you the truth about their ontology. And so let me get to where the messages are. Where are the messages? Bear with me, bear with me. Trust me, it's worth it. Where are my messages for... Um, inbox, here we go. Okay. I'm I'm looking for it right now, so bear with me here. I don't know if they I don't know if they blocked me. They probably blocked me. I'm looking it up as we speak to try and find the person. Pretty much what they said was like, I'm an atheist. And they said, but everything the Christians saying, they got a point and they're right. And it's true. Like they they I'm an atheist, but it all makes sense. And Christianity is true. And I was like, then become a Christian. Like, what are you waiting for? I don't know what you're, if Christianity makes the most sense to you and it somehow has all the evidence you needed. Why aren't you a Christian? Unless you really are. And you're just saying to me, playing a psychological game that you're an atheist, but Christianity makes way better sense than atheists, like than the whole conclusion of naturalism and things like that. I told him, go be a Christian then. Isn't that like, wouldn't you tell someone if they think something makes the most sense, you go be it then? It, it just makes no sense to me why they wouldn't. So Jim Bob, you've jacked me up twice in a row. Let's see if strike three comes because I haven't seen if you've, if you've messaged again, I'm afraid I might cry on air. 
Because I don't know if I could handle it. I don't know where you at. There you go. There you go. Christianity is also the best evolutionary choice. I mean, you're, you're making a case for Christianity here, dude. I think everybody's going to end up becoming a Christian after this. If you're not already one, right? Like this is super, super strong evidence of showing why Christianity is the case. Crown noise. Thank you so much for the super chat. I left new Testament Israelite doctrine because I studied and Isaiah 42 says the anointed one was not to be heard preaching in the streets and all of the inconsistency of the new Testament. I am here to learn more. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Message me, email me. I'd love to hear more about it. I would. I love hearing stories about people who found themselves and they've found freedom in that. It always makes me happy. Makes me happy. But seriously, really do appreciate that. And I'm interested to hear why different people have come to face that and you know whatever reasons they left. Hold on. Did we did we get anywhere here? No, I got I got beat. I got silenced. Dang it, Jim Bob. You I wanted you to embarrass me some more in the chat, but okay, fine. To the couple hundred of people watching right now, go and convert to Christianity. You know, he caught me. You know, this is this I can't say anything, you know. Uh, I've been playing game this whole time and uh, I'm confessing now, making the confession. Mm. Yes, I am, Mark. I am. And I ain't ashamed of it. All right, everybody. I think we should go and enjoy our day, right? Everybody should have a communal get together. Among a mill, put some music on. If you can drink and not abuse it like me, get you some beer and practice what the ancient Globeki Tepe people practiced. Have a few social hangouts, get the music going, chatter it up, enjoy it, and uh, consider the natural explanations before jumping to magical thinking or jumping to conclusions. Like Christopher Hitchens used to say in the debates when he was still alive, why did God wait hundreds of thousands of years to show up and to give his revelation to mankind? Why is it now showing up? We've got it now in this religion. Uh, and the one prophet, the one man finally shows up. And all the suffering, death, famine, disease, and all these things happened for hundreds of thousands of years. But now all of a sudden, popping up at just the right time when you... <laughs> You are born and you exist here. It's a lot of interesting things. A lot of interesting things to say. Uh-oh, Trudeau Joe just became a god. We just witnessed it. Go spread the gospel. Uh, you are a god here at this point. And um, we need to go and share that. Uh, will we get a person named Mark? Well, we do have a person named Mark. Mark's in the chat. He's a Hebrew Israelite. Mark, will you write a gospel? Um, will someone named Matthew in the chat copy Mark and then just kind of make some changes what they disagree with the Hebrew Israelite on? And then we need a Luke. Is there someone named Luke in the chat that can, can write using Mark, maybe possibly knowing Matthew? You and Matthew can figure it out. I don't care which one of you copy each other because that's disputed to this day. And then uh, maybe I had a Q version of a gospel floating around. Maybe it's from my channel that you guys are using the information from to know that Trudeau Joe just became a god. Then we need someone named John who can come up with some wild idea where like Trudeau turned water into wine. Why? Because we just witnessed them become a god. They just became a god. They became a member of Myth Vision. Hallelujah. Yes, I triggered you, my friend. I know. But you know what? When you witness gods like this, how can you deny them? How can you deny? Oh my gosh. I just triggered another god. Daniel, we need a gospel that speaks about multiple apotheoses, not just one guy. Let's be fair. We need some girls in here too, okay? This, this misogynistic BS needs to stop. We don't need to have a patriarchal system. I want, now scratch that. 
We had four Gospels written by men named after men. We need four Gospels written by girls for Daniel. Can we get some volunteers in the chat here? We need some. Maybe someone named Mary or Martha can pop in and write their Gospel. And we'll call this the Gnostic apotheosis of Daniel Whitaker. Why don't we do that? Let's do it. Everybody witnessed it. Come on. Can I get an amen in the chat? Hallelujah. Come on. Come on now. Now, can I say hallelujah, Daniel, since it triggers you before? Can I say it for you at least since you're deified at this point? Hallelujah. Yes. Alan, you're right. It, myth vision something else. I try to tell people they just don't get the power of it. Mm, 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 mm. I so agree. Originally, society was matriarchal and no doubt religion too. Titan? Titan has the, the he has a thunderbolt in his hands and he's not going to play. He'll do like Zeus and just, whoosh. he keeps people on track in the, in the chat. I appreciate you keeping Mount Olympus safe, Titan. Daniel says, of course. Well, Daniel, when I say hallelujah, I think of you now. Thank you for joining and becoming a member. <laughs> um, are you at war with yourself, bro? You good? I'm, I'm just having fun. I'm being literally just goofy. In fact, my wife, used, she always tells me, like, Derek, if you were really the way you act off camera, just goofy, be yourself, probably a ton of more people would watch you because you're just silly. And um, I don't know. Just that's how I am. If you heard me playing Call of Duty and stuff, you'd be like, this dude's a trip. I know how to have a little fun. I do know how to have a little fun. Oh, look, we have some, we have, dude, we got some people, amen, and wow, everybody's feeling the spirit right now. Amen. Mm, amen. Amen. Amen, hallelujah. Can you and these two other gods that popped up make me win the lottery today or tomorrow? Look, I could, like, you know, God could stop evil, right? But... I just don't want to, right? That's all. Like, maybe if you go and play, we'll see. We'll see. If you win, it's because I, of course, because I did it. I made sure that if you lose, it's because, like I said, maybe. But really, it's because I didn't let you win. You know what I mean? So once you win the lottery, just remember who you're thinking of. That's how you know. You know after the fact. Let's just have an X event to prophecy take place. Anything good that ever happens in your life, ha ma ba ba shiba ba ba ba. Anything good that happens in constellation Pegasus's life is because of the divine powers of myth vision. So when you look back, you know the whole reason it was good is because of that. And if you ever step on a crack, you break your mom's back. Just thought I'd let you know that too. In case you didn't know that. Hello, you y'all. <laughs> oh. Thank you, everybody in the chat, even the ones who disagree with me. I had fun at the end of this and just just having fun, you know. I'm having fun. I'm being stupid on purpose. Just wanted to say I'm a believer and I believe in what you are doing. It's important for us to understand the historical critical reality of our beliefs. Andy, thank you. And I hope that what you believe helps you and it is something that helps you find meaning and purpose and, you know, we can grow together toward a better goal and a common goal in the end. But yeah, I, I love to see that kind of stuff. Like I love to hear people. There are people, hate to break it to you. I have a lot of Christians who actually are on the Patreon. You know, the Eastern uh, church, they have a doctrine that's very like kind of a deification process. Western church is a bit different. But the Eastern Orthodox, they do have a deification. Well, guess what? When you join Myth Vision's Patreon, there's a deification process happening. But I seriously have financial support from Christians. There are Christians who go in there and they go, I couldn't care less about your ontology, your naturalism, but you bring the best scholarship. You bring amazing scholarship and no other channel on YouTube does that. And for that very reason, I support what you do. And I'm like, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate that for real. 
If you can't laugh, it's not worth it. See, you're having the gift of the gods now. Laughter is part of that. It happens. You can greatly increase your chances of winning the lottery by buying a ticket. Follow me for more life advice. <laughs> That's a fact. That is a fact. Okay, I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get off of here. I'm going to go out front, make sure that the sign hasn't blown over, the four cell sign. I hope I can plan some more episodes in the future. Let's do some more talks. And uh, thank you. I really do appreciate it. This was one of those episodes that I honestly think it's underappreciated that more people should consider looking into. So there you have it. Join the Patreon. Get True Salvation. Become a member of the Myth Vision page, uh, YouTube channel. So every time you comment in the chat, I see next to your name the symbol of God. Don't you see it, Trudeau Joe? Look at the symbol of divineness. And when you see that, roll out the red carpet because those members get rolling out of the red carpet. That's just the way the cookie crumbles. I'm off. Thank you so much, everybody. Never forget that we are. Myth Vision. Later.